I finally made it. America. Fresh air, golden skies. People in the streets. Why did we want to come here again? Police! You're under arrest! Ah, uh, alright. I remember. It's time to fight the government. Greetings and salutations everyone, and welcome to the long-awaited sequel to Digital Human Saga. Last episode, an angel from above brought demonic cannibalism to West Side Story. So today, we're sending cannibalism back to them down the barrel of a gun. Can you beat Digital Devil Saga 2 without using any demons? The rules are the same as last time. At no point are the characters' demon forms allowed to have any effect on anything. For anyone who needs a refresher on the benefits of demon forms, all skills in this game can be classified as active or passive. Active skills, like the fire type Agi, can only be used while in demon form. This locks our units out of a large majority of the game's options, including healing, buffing, debuffing, and many more. Additionally, demon forms also deal more and take less damage than human forms. As such, for a truly demonless run, we cannot deal or take any damage in demon form, use healing spells in or outside of battle, or do anything else that really feels demon-y. To make this significantly easier, we'll be making use of the human form passive, a skill unlocked in New Game Plus that forces the unit to stop battles in human form, rather than having to spend an action to change back. Of course, New Game Plus typically retains all learned skills, which would allow us to unlock skills we could use outside of the run, which would be an issue. For the DDS1 run, we use the Game Shark code to save a New Game Plus save without any progress on it. However, in DDS2, for some reason, your skills are only retained if your New Game Plus file is on Normal Mode. Hard Mode does not retain any of your skills. Whether this is a bug or intentional cruelty on Atlas's part, it's exactly what I want. So after Surf fires five shots into these mooks in the opening movie, we make a save with our DDS1 demonless file, beat the entire game, and then New Game Plus to begin our journey, no cheats required. As we load into the game, we get some exposition from this guy in case you didn't watch the last video, which you should, before finding ourselves in a dumpy room with a couple of random kids. So you're telling me we killed all of our friends, fought gods and demons and whatever the hell that tattooed kid was just to end up in post-apocalyptic Seattle? To be fair, outside of demons killing people instead of people killing people, it isn't much different from regular Seattle. And the black hole sun in the sky? Actually, that one wasn't them. Apparently, God's mad at us. Understood. So we have to fight God. Again. You... make a habit of fighting God? And the government. Where is it? Well, the soldiers have the way blocked, and the only way out is through the... Welcome to the worst area in the game. No, I'm not fucking kidding. Prior to the tutorial dungeon in DDS1, the game gave you access to two large karma terminals to heal and use as save points, a shop to buy items and ammo, a small terminal outside the boss, various loot locations, the works. This meant that in the event that anything in Svatistana actually gave you trouble, you could always retreat, buy more items, and go back in. In Digital Devil Saga 2, you get none of that. You start at the opening of a dungeon with no way to go but forward. No renewable item sources, no shops, no nothing. There are small terminals, but the only large terminal is at the start of the area. Not to mention, you can't even use it to heal. Because you don't even unlock the concept of money before you get out of this area. That's right, typically battles give you money relative to how quickly you beat them, but that only happens after you exit the occupied sector. Before that, battles literally give you zero dollars. This is the tutorial area, but it leaves you so strapped for resources that you're living moment to moment, second guessing every item just to make it to the next safe zone. If I had to come up with an analog for challenge run tutorials, DDS1 Demonless will teach you how to swim, DDS2 Demonless will tie weights to your ankles and throw you in the ocean. I'm about to thunder cut these challenge run into the ocean. As such, we're gonna need to learn how to swim quickly. The first tutorial battle is a good way to remind yourself of the way everyone's guns work. Setup's handgun is still the strongest, with good single target damage and a solid crit rate. Argilla's rifle deals about 25% less damage than Setup's handgun, but has a significantly higher crit rate. Meanwhile, Gale's assault rifle deals a little under half as much damage as Setup's per bullet, but hits two to four times on random targets. 
though no one target will be hit more than twice. I recommend prioritizing sort of for damage, then passing with one of your other units to get him another turn. If you're fighting multiple enemies, have Gale Fire and Argilla pass. If you're fighting a single enemy, have Argilla Fire and have Gale pass. Once you win, Surf should level up. I saw some people last video say leveling strength does not affect gun damage, but I wanted to err on the safe side and keep Surf's strength up, since I swear it does, but I might just be seeing things. As for the other stats, magic increases damage dealt with items and decreases incoming magic damage, vitality increases your health, agility increases your evasion and accuracy, and luck increases your critical hit rate and decreases the odds of you getting surprised by enemies. However, we also have another tool at our disposal. Combo Actions Returning from DDS-1 is Crossfire, which sees everyone strike a cool pose, Self twirls his gun, Argel flips her hair, Gale touches his forehead, before dealing heavily increased damage at the cost of three actions. But new to DDS-2 is Twin Shot, which only consumes two actions. Twin Shot isn't as strong as Crossfire, but is a little stronger than both units firing into the same target. This is especially important for Gale, who, when firing on one target, will flip a coin between doing as much damage as Argilla or half as much. With Twin Shot, he can mitigate this downside. That said, both Twin Shot and Crossfire do cost HP to use, 7 and 10% respectively, which means it's not an option you'll be able to go with all the time, but it and Crossfire are both options you should keep in mind. After you complete the tutorial, you'll also fight some Zen, who are mercifully weak to gun, before arriving at your first healing point. Your goal is now to make it through the scripted fights and random encounters to get to the next healing point. Keep in mind how far away you are from the healing point you came from. If you don't think you can make it to the next one in time, turn around. The more you fight, the stronger you'll get, and the further you'll be able to go next time. Much of what's in this area is designed to teach you about searching for weaknesses with the unit's demon forms. Zhen and Hua Po are weak to ice, but strong against earth. Kelpie and Bugaboo are weak to force, but strong against ice. But thankfully, nothing here is immune to the Second Amendment. Also, don't think we're going to be training anything of their MP today. Low-level spells like Bufu only cost around 3 MP, so it's best to just gun everything down. A little ways ahead, a scripted encounter will include your first untransformed Karma Soldier, which introduces enemies that fight like you do. Untransformed enemies can use items and will use a rifle for their standard attack, which fires a gun element shot at a single target. You might think this is bad, as they are the only enemies which can take advantage of your new gun weakness. However, this works both ways. They're human too, which means you can take advantage of his gun weakness just as much as he can yours. After a while, he decides that free weak hits aren't effective and transforms into a Pavelside. Pavelside can do large single target damage and has a solid chance to poison a target. Poison will chip away at your health while also lowering your attack, so you'll want to avoid this if possible. You might have a Dispoison on hand, so if one unit gets poisoned, use it, but you'll want to try and kill him as quickly as possible. A good strategy can be to make use of combo attacks. A poisoned target will take damage if they instigate the combo, but they can still participate for free. Making use of Crossfire or Twin Shot can be an effective means of skipping a poison unit's turn. Once you get to this middle room, you are officially halfway there, and have made it to another healing point. If you want to take a break from encounters, you can go see the people turned to stone by the Cuvier Syndrome, but there's no save point here and no items, so heal up and keep moving. Despite what you might think is smart, I would recommend going through as much of this area as you can in order to find every single lootable item. Every item is a new option you can use, and even though you do want to use them sparingly, it's always a good idea to have them on hand. Most notably, along the east path from this heal point, you can find a shot shell. Compared to our standard 8 power bullets, these sport a notable 16, so slap them on right away. Now you could give them to Surf, and I wouldn't blame you, but consider, Surf is already doing the most damage out of the group. If you give them to Gale, he can combo off of Surf increasing the damage you get out of all of your units. The most difficult fight, prior to the boss at least, is easily Hound Unit Charlie. They start out fairly easy, with just a Bugaboo and an Andras, but are reinforced by a Tarask. The wiki doesn't say that the Tarask has gun resistance, but I felt like Surf's handgun was doing 8 damage before, and it's doing around 5 now, so I'm not ruling out some hidden 20% resistance. And he loves to spam Mad Rush, which will do solid damage 2-4 to four times on random targets. Twin shots are your friend here, and you should try to make it so that whoever you gave the shot shell to is in the combo as much as possible. 
you need to micromanage damage on this guy, as with 144 HP and being capable of almost 80 damage a turn, you want this dude dead as soon as possible. On my successful run, I did have to use a single ration to keep Gale from going down too soon, but after 12 tries, I managed to knock this turtle dude off of his weird claw-like feet. Finally, after what feels like forever, and a bit wounded, we make our way to the boss of the area, a Vitala with two Andres as support. From the start of the occupied sector until now, I only used two rations. So going into this fight, I had three rations, two medical kits, a Soma drop, a couple revival beads, a revival gem, three Molotovs, two ice blasts, and two sonic stones. I hope you were conserving as much as I was, because holy shit, you're going to need it. We don't have any way to cast Terra for Earth damage, so we can't take advantage of the Andres' weakness. However, Vitala is weak to Force, and we do have a couple Sonic Stones. Thus, I recommend by throwing all of them at him immediately, followed by every other attack item you have. The Andres have 200 HP, so killing them as quickly as possible is extremely important to minimize their turn economy. Also, they can cast Void Force on their turn, so it's best to just get your Force damage on the board now. Once you're out of Molotovs, focus on having Surf fire with his handgun and Gale using combo attacks. After a while, Vitala will go for Mind Charge, shout, WITNESS THE FURY OF MY BODY, and then use Terra Surge for roughly 50 damage to the entire party. There is literally no way we can dodge this besides good luck, so we'll have to use our healing items to try and mitigate it. Try and get as much use out of your healing items as you can. Only use rations if you'll get the full 50 health, and don't use a medical kit unless the entire group is low. It might be the weakest party heal in the game, but right now, it fully heals the entire group, so it's nothing to sneeze at. It's worth noting that once he starts using Terra Burst, he'll enter a predictable pattern. Attack with a standard attack, or body rush, buff using Mind Charge, fire off a Terra Burst, and then repeat. If you know he's going to spend the next turn casting Mind Charge, you can spend a lot of your HP using combo attacks, and then heal up on the following turn. Also, don't be afraid to let somebody go down. You do have revive items, and there will be occasion to buy more later. Getting out of this fight is the top priority. If you can save stuff like the Soma Drop and the Revival Bead, awesome, but don't be so stingy you throw the run. Use whatever you need to to get out of the fight, and eventually, Vitala goes down and we can finally leave the Occupied Sector. After a quick introduction to Roland, we finally arrive at the Lokapala Secret City. Supposedly, Lokapala means Guardians of the Gods, but they're really just the Guardians of this single shop. Thankfully, that may as well be my god, because oh my god, I've never been so happy to see a shop in my life. Unfortunately, they won't sell to us until we talk to Roland. Roland gives the entire party the first of several exposition dumps the game provides to you. Over the course of a 10 minute cutscene, yes I timed it, he informs the party that they have Cielo in custody, the junkyard was actually a Karma Society program called the Asura Project, the Embryon are actually computer programs that were going to be used as combat AI for the society, the program was headed by Colonel Terence Beck who- That is not his face. Thank you, Gail. <clears throat> the reason they wanted this was to turn all of their men into demons so they could survive the Cuvier Syndrome, a virus from the sun that turns people to stone. Jenna Angel, yes the boss from last game, works with the IESC to discover that demon forms protect you from the sun, and that they can be controlled via Sarah, whom they call number 19, the Cyber Shaman. Shit, can you sum it up in 20 words or less? Very well. <coughs> Bring us the Cyber Shaman, or we'll keep your friend. Appeal to emotion. You're, you're going after Sarah anyway. It only makes sense for us Fun to work together. You piece of shit. At How do you keep doing that with your mouth? After Gale defeats Roland with facts and logic, Roland finishes the drink he just finished, and we can now access the rest of the fucking game. Adil is kind enough to give you two medical kits, a huge ammo upgrade in the frigid shot, and the hacking disc, which allows us to finally download Mantra. Just like last game, Mantra are how we unlock skills for our characters. 
but the Mantra system has seen a bit of an overhaul. Rather than being a linear line-based system like in DDS1, the Mantra Grid is now a series of hexagons branching out in every direction. When you finish one mantra, you gain access to every hexagon adjacent to it. In addition, if every mantra adjacent to one of these weird hexes with purple dots is mastered by at least one unit in your party, you unlock an esoteric mantra. Some esoterics are passive stat increases for your entire party, but others are additional skills you can access, like mutual karma, item find, and minimum and maximum critical. The system allows for a lot of freedom in choosing how to build your units, and I quite like it. Regardless, I recommend prioritizing moving north on the grid, likely purchasing Shura first. Not only is it the cheapest option, but it starts you towards learning some very important passives for the run. Mantras do cost money though, and for that, we arrive at the Mad Mart. The Mad Mart is the source of so much pain and suffering in this challenge run that it makes me want to take that ammo on their sign and put it into my skull. That TV there, it broadcasts the latest sucker they wrote into this nightmare scheme. If you transfer your DDS1 save over, the store owner Kathy will buy Surf's tag ring for a varying amount of money, depending on how much money you had last game. Since we were rich as fuck, she buys it for $20,000. The only saving grace of this capitalist hellscape is that the Mad Mart has a point system. You gain one point for every $100 you buy or sell. So if you were to buy three rations for $100 each, two disc poisons for $200 each, and a revival bead for $500, that would be $1,200 and get you 12 points. As you gain points, you rank up with the shop, which unlocks additional merchandise and causes them to sell stuff for less and buy it off you for more. After pawning all of my chakra drops for $7,500 and buying some rations and revival beads, this is enough to put me at rank 2 which would be the point they start selling Karma Rings, but since we haven't unlocked them yet, it doesn't. You know what does unlock at rank 2 though? LOOT BOXES! I'm not joking. Once you hit rank 2, you unlock the first of three loot boxes, the Crimson Box. These loot boxes are unaffected by the price drops from ranking up the shop, and also don't even earn you points. When you open one up, you earn one to three random items from that box's item pool and every box has a special karma ring which can only be obtained through these boxes. And the Crimson Box... Hallelujah! Holy shit! The Crimson Box is special, because not only does it drop the Rich Ring, a karma ring which increases the money you earn from battles by 10%, something we are going to need, but it also contains every single attack item in the game. And outside of getting them as random drops, which is dependent on enemies in the area, this is the only way we have to obtain attack items. That's right, we can no longer buy attack items on our own. The only plus side to this is that we can technically obtain wild cards and wild bombs significantly sooner. The downside is we cannot willingly obtain the item we want. Need a way to cast Zeo for electric damage? Time to gamble your life away! If we need a certain element for a certain fight, we must submit ourselves to the whims of the gacha. I recommend buying Crimson Boxes until you obtain the Rich Ring as soon as possible. If you don't get it, reset and try again. It is that important. Rank 2 also unlocks Frigid Shots, which I recommend buying for everybody once you obtain the Rich Ring. Not only are they the highest power option right now, but the ability to freeze targets is extremely useful. After we move forward, we get some exposition about Angel planning to lobotomize Sarah, along with the fact that Angel is a hermaphrodite and is both Sarah's mother and her father. Lingering on that as long as the game does, the game then proceeds to throw us into a fight against two particularly noteworthy ghouls. I see that you have a tutor in your party that uses ice. Too bad I have my Heho Ring equipped. Ice has no effect on me what- well, look, that clock status in this game actually have a fairly solid chance to activate, and Frozen is one of the best. Just like Shock, any physical attacks against the Frozen enemy will be a guaranteed crit. Additionally, Freeze cancels out any resistances, or better, that the unit has to fizz and gun. So this is a great way to get around some guaranteed damage. Plus, since we do this via a gun attack, it gets around the he ho ring he had, which gave him immunity to ice attacks. After we defeat the ghoul, he drops the power ring, the berserker ring if you're on a new game plus save, as well as the aforementioned he-ho ring, 
This is a reward for beating King Frost back in Digital Devil Saga 1. If you transfer your save data over, you unlock additional karma rings throughout this game's story. Now, you could consider using these rings of faux pas, since I literally had to play a separate game in order to unlock them, and I understand that. So I'll say that I can only use them if I beat Digital Devil Saga 1 without using any demons. Oh wait! Beating the ghouls also unlocks karma rings back at the Mad Mart, like the Magic Ring and Quick Ring, which provide boosts to magic and agility, respectively. Most karma rings only provide small boosts to stats, but some do get creative, like the Heho Ring providing outright immunity to ice, so I recommend seeking out them all. Speaking of, I should probably talk about that Berserker Ring, shouldn't I? At 7 eighths and maximum solo noise, you have a chance to start the battle in Berserk Mode. Berserk Mode sees the entire party enter a halfway state between human and demon form. In this state, your units still cannot make use of magic skills, but they can now use physical and hunt skills. All attacks also become either physical or hunt almighty, and gain a huge boost in damage and a 90% crit rate. However, all of your units take an extremely large penalty to hit, as well as taking significantly more damage. Running away from battles in this state is guaranteed, however, winning the fight gives you 2.5 times more experience, although it does not give you any additional AP for leveling your mantra. This turns any fight in the game into a gamble. Winning provides you a huge experience boost, but it's also much easier to lose. The Berserker Ring we just got is interesting too, as it guarantees every non-scripted fight will start in Berserk mode. But this begs the question, is this a demon? It doesn't look human, but it doesn't look demon either. We'll say that Berserk mode is half allowed. As stated, fleeing battle is guaranteed, so we'll flee from every encounter that we get into while Berserk mode. Whether that Berserk happens naturally or because I'm wearing the ring is not my concern. The dungeon itself isn't all that difficult to deal with. We have to navigate a series of short corridors and walk with a repairman to repair cables that allow us to make our way to the end of the underwater cable. I recommend combing the place from top to bottom. The paths aren't that long, and the loot is actually fairly useful. Particularly of note are the Clover and Narcissus, plant that you can sell to Mad Mark for free money, and the HP data, which is this game's incenses, fully healing your HP and, in the case of the HP data specifically, increasing your maximum HP by 10. Between restoring more HP than most items and boosting your stats, you'll want to use these sparingly, though when you do, I recommend giving it to Surf, for reasons we'll get into later. At the end of the cable, we come across this guy, who anamorphs into a Hecatone Kyrus. Literally the second boss in the game, and he's already taking advantage of our weaknesses. Hecatone Kyrus is the pinnacle of a beefy physical boy, sporting 1000 HP, strong physical attacks, and COUNTER! This means our most consistent source of damage, being our guns, have a 40% chance to bounce back at us. While the War of Attrition would certainly be on the table with enough healing items, this becomes an issue when he breaks out his unique attack, Hundred Fist. <laughs> this starts as a weak all-target physical move, but it rises in power every time he uses it. Double power, triple power, until eventually the damage is simply too high. This rules out attrition strats. We have to kill him before the damage gets too high for us to heal off. So it's... After reloading until I got a decent gotcha result, I tried the fight again. Hecatone Kyrus is weak to Earth, so any landmines or magnite bombs you obtain will be super useful. If you have them, sneaking in a wild card or wild bomb isn't a bad idea either. They won't count as weak hits, but they still do a good amount of damage. But what really turned this fight around for me was, ironically, Counter. Not his, mine. Counter is only one mantra away from critical, and while it's pretty costly at 10k, I think we all saw how good it was last game. And this paid off, giving me the last little bit of damage I needed to grab Hecatone Kyrus by his lock and pull him down. Beating Hecatone Kyrus rewards you with a yellow crystal, your first of many add-on gems. These gems can be slotted into karma rings, which cause the wearer of that ring to gain additional stat boosts. The type depends on the gem. Cat's Eye boosts strength, Ruby boosts agility, etc. Each ring has a limited number of slots that you can put gems into, and once you fill all the slots, you will not be able to add more unless you remove them all, destroying the gems in the process. This is a good way to get small incremental boosts to your core stats, like magic for spell defense or vitality for HP. Once we get out, we officially unlock our next two party members. Hey guys! Cielo! Mind if I make it five? How do you tend to help? You said you fight with guns. I'm quite handy with a shotgun. 
shotgun? Right. I can hit an entire group at once with my shotgun. I'll talk it. <sighs> Not again. Sorry, bro. Wait, what? This unlocks Cielo and Roland. Branded with the Rainbow Arch, Cielo remains a great side grade to Gale. His damage per bullet is around 30% of Seraph's, but his high hit rate makes him a solid option for group encounters. Meanwhile, Gale's slightly stronger bullets make him useful in group fights, but still stronger if the battle becomes single target. Whether Gale or Cielo is more preferable is an encounter by encounter basis, but you'll usually want one of them alongside both your single target users. As for Roland, he operates as a slightly more balanced heat. Not forsaking magic as hard as his predecessor, but still having enough strength to hit hard when needed. The issue, however, is the same as last game. Gale and Cielo do comparable damage to Roland per shot, and have a good chance to hit a target multiple times. This means that Roland is really only useful in encounters with four or more targets, a situation which is extremely uncommon. As such, he'll be joining Heat and Garbage for the foreseeable future. Out of the frying pan and into another, we were immediately thrown into the internment facility to prevent the society from turning Fred's friend Timmy and other civilian prisoners from being processed into demon food. There's no easy way back to the local pala base, unless you want to trek through the entire underwater cable again, but thankfully we are not without a saving grace. The first room in the dungeon contains a small healing station and a small karma terminal, so you can do any healing and saving here. But more important is this guy shaking his left leg. This here's Johnny, and he runs the Mad Mod Express. In case you thought you were safe from capitalism, don't worry, it's wherever he says it is. While I don't usually turn down shops in unexpected places, it's a pressing reminder that I can never truly escape. After moving forward for a bit, we have a mandatory encounter against two new A. Roland then proceeds to transform into Indra for all of 5 seconds before immediately reverting. Worth noting, Roland will literally force himself into the third slot of your party if he isn't already in there, so I recommend just putting him in the party for now. These guys aren't that hard, and frigid shots make quick work of them. Following this battle, we will literally never use our new heat ever again, so strip him of his ammo and give it to somebody else. Unless you did a lot of shopping and were able to unlock the next level, this ammo is probably the strongest option you can have. On the way in, we find what might actually be the best way to farm experience. Field hunting. In a field hunt, you transform into a demon, which isn't allowed, so neither is field hunting. Okay, in all seriousness, I elected not to use field hunting for the bit, but it is legitimately useful. Depending on how many of these little purple dudes you kill, a different number of Matama will show up after the hunt is done. You gain Atma towards your mantra just for doing a field hunt at all. And you gain large amounts of experience and even more Atma if you're able to kill any of the Matama, something very possible if you're using items. If you're having trouble, I recommend making use of the game's camera controls. If you hold circle and press L or R1, you'll snap the camera 90 degrees to the left or right, respectively. Since most field hunt areas are narrow corridors, this can make it easier to be quick about things and get as many purple dudes as possible. Regardless of whether you use field hunting or not, the enemies around here aren't too difficult. Nue and Aurobus are fairly easy to take down and don't do much of anything to stop you. Oncart is really the only remotely concerning fight, due to him resisting gun, but he's still not that much of an issue. The real problem comes once we get to the cells and meet the Jailer. Kumhanda opens it with Black Vine, which immediately afflicts everyone with a unique stun status that ends the fight instantly. Well, fuck this fucking game! Thankfully, this isn't a game over, as we just get thrown into jail. A local agent comes and tells us that he's got a plan to break everyone out of here. Apparently, the society hasn't fully accepted cannibalism, so they use this facility to process carcasses into canned food. Thankfully, this means we can poison Kumhanda's lunch. This leads to one of my favorite minigames in the entire franchise. You broke out of the cell, huh? We must have rats. <laughs> but that doesn't matter. It's been a long time since I felt the thrill of the hunt. We have to find a specific cell in order to get information on how to poison the food, providing a password to get inside, all the while the Jailer is stalking us. The Jailer will slowly move towards you until he can see you, at which point he'll take off running towards you to try and grab you. And if you want to know how that feels, maybe an old clip from my stream will help convey that. Oh, look at, look at that fucking saunter! Look at him go! Oh, fuck! Oh, no, 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 no! Once he starts sprinting, nothing will stop him. So stay at least a corner away from him at all times, and do keep in mind that he is fully capable of turning around. And to make matters even more fun, talking to NPCs does not freeze the Jailer. Meaning even if you do talk to the right NPC, if you aren't quick enough by getting into the cell... You thought you were safe because you were in a cutscene? 
<laughs> Thank you, Shin Megami Tensei. Thankfully, this only sends you back to the jail cell. But each time, the jailer will swing more and more, so you really don't want to get caught at all. The first guy is on the east side of basement 1. Once you find him, tell him about the unbearable solar noise and he'll let you in. This guy has discovered what the jailer's favorite food is. 15 year olds. <laughs> he gives you the key cards to the next floor, so with newfound resolve on killing a man, we move down to the second basement. This floor is a little bit more difficult to navigate, filled with walls that can block your progress, so take your time and plan your movements. If the jailer is sprinting at you, you can retreat to the first floor in order to reset him back to the starting position on the second floor. Once you get to the southwesternmost cell on the second floor, tell him tonight's dinner is canned surprise. Turns out, this is exactly the plan. With some special ingredients on the next floor, we can prepare canned surprise a la locapala. Unfortunately, the jailer won't make that so easy. Good hunter always has a few tools at his disposal. Time to rope you in! At this stage, the Jailer starts making use of traps, and will camp the door to the next floor until you get close enough for him to start chasing you. Time it correctly so you can dodge the traps, and this won't be too difficult, but if you do mistime it, Seth will be stunned until the trap disables. This can be anywhere from barely a second to almost three seconds, so avoid these at all costs. On the third and final floor, the Jailer isn't fucking around anymore. This is the most labyrinth-themed floor so far, and it's littered with traps and dead ends. To make it worse, he's back to stalking you, so you have to figure out where and when to go under pressure. The best way to handle this is to wait for Kumhanda to make a move before making your own, and to watch the map. If you aren't careful, you can trap yourself, and from there, there's nothing to do but let Kumhanda send you back to jail. The ingredients are in one of the southwest cells, so after a narrow escape, we grab ourselves some rotting blob and find- the exit is a dead end and locked behind multiple traps. I find it's best to lead him to a loop and hope the traps are favorable for you, because oh my god, this one almost feels like luck. Once you're out though, make a break for the save point. Random encounters are turned on on this floor, but the large terminal means we won't have to go through the jail cells again. We can also heal off any damage we took and ailments we might have. In the final room, there are various opened cans of meat. We grab the final key and walk out into the most pathetic ambush of all time. A robot will try to burn you while the Necromata try to give you that left-handed slap. But as most people do in real life, they die to being shot in the face. Following this, we can teleport back upstairs, turn on the power, toss the blob in the machine, and out pops our canned surprise. Head back to the control room and set up your trap, which leads to quite possibly the funniest dialogue in the entire game. <laughs> Need a bathroom? It's best to be prepared. You should always carry a disache with you. I love dialogue that references in-game mechanics so much. This starts the real fight with the Jailer, and even afflicted with the shits, he's still pretty challenging. He has a lot of hard-hitting moves including Zanma and Muzanma, as well as Power Wave. Stun Wave is easily one of his most annoying moves since it lowers accuracy, evasion, and defense if stun procs. Plus, he's still packing Black Bind, although it has been reduced to 50% odds. Bind is a unique status that prevents you from taking any action, but combos off of his other unique move, Gorge. Gorge is a physical almighty attack that hits harder than most of his other options, heals Kumhanda equal to the damage dealt, and doubles its damage if he's attacking somebody inflicted with Black Bind. And nothing heals Bind but time. That said, he's not guaranteed to use Gorge on a bound target, so whether or not you want to gamble on healing a bound target is frankly up to you. This doesn't leave us with too many options. One fun fact about this fight is that he can actually be muted and takes double damage from mute element moves, although it doesn't count as a weakness. Sadly, we can't take advantage of this fact, but we can take advantage of his electric weakness for additional turns. So if you're struggling with this fight, playing the gacha for electric items is an option. Furthermore, Power Wave and Gorge are physical, so I grinded Mantra to get everybody else counter. While it's only a 40% chance per person, Power Wave gives us around a 79% chance that somebody will counterattack if the entire party has counter, which is pretty good odds. He has 1000 HP and likes to go for Black Bind a lot more than his other options, so its low accuracy can mean a lot of wasted turns. Prioritize Magic with Argilla and Guns with Seraph, and before long, the Jailer will suffer a fatal heart attack. Following this, my, uh, 
my my game bugged out and made Roland Japanese for a second. So okay, Adil's gonna raise some hell in the city. So apparently Roland's bilingual now. Who knew? Anyway, Gale finds out that Fred is Lupa's child and comforts him, telling him to be a peaceful child. And on that note, it's time to go destroy society. The Karma Society, to be specific. On the way there, we can pit stop at the urban area and Sala Park. There's nothing really here yet, but we get to see the residents of society with their dumbass karma circles around their necks talk about how much better they are than everybody else. Arriving at the headquarters of society... God, that's already starting to not sound like a word. We actually have an opportunity to get a powerful karma gem by talking to this guy. He came to register his son with a name, but can't decide. The gem you get depends on the boy name you suggest. Cielo will provide you with a blood ruby, which provides a plus three to agility. Gale gives a pink crystal, which is a plus three to magic. Heat results in a tiger's eye for plus three to strength. And Seraph is a pink sapphire, which provides a plus four to a random stat. I recommend going with Seraph, as you can just save and reload until you get the stat you want. DDS2 innovates by including its annoying tower level in the middle of the game, rather than at the end. While the opening sections of this area feature no enemies, eventually the society ambushes us and threatens to send us to AI heaven. Allowing them to keep talking results in them taking the first turn in the fight, so attack them while they talk and get the first turn. The upside to this area is that encounters here have a much higher chance than normal to be untransformed society soldiers. Since the society is weak to being shot, this allows us some easier experience than normal. Moreover, killing anybody part of society before they transform has an increased chance of dropping attack items, which allows us to circumvent gotcha hell. Additionally, many of the encounters here are with angels who will cast expel skills into us, giving us free turns due to our innate expel immunity. The downside of this area is that I think the society saw how good our strategy was last game, because they seem to have stolen it. A lot of encounters here have both physical and gun resistance, including counter or even counter strike in their movesets, sometimes even both. Archangel, Satanta, and Titan all have gun resistance, Satanta has counter and power charge, and Titan and Atavaka have counter strike. The encounters in this area either favor expel or favor physical, and if you get the latter, you have a choice. Option 1 is spending resources, attack items, or healing to make the fight manageable. Option 2 is trying to do the fight with guns while risking getting counterattacked and forcing you to spend healing items anyway. And option 3 is trying to run away, which risks failing and opening yourself up to attack. No option is good. Have fun! And speaking of stealing our strategies, after these two goons shot us from the side, they turn into Elagor for a forced encounter. If you beat Alan Vickman in the DS1, they're kind enough to spoil their abilities to you. Oh yeah. There's something else that you might like to hear. See this divine ring? It was made from the cell data you gathered in the junkyard. <laughs> you devoured Metatron and exchanged his cell at the temple, huh? Well, I'm invincible to Hama thanks to you! Ha <laughs> ha! You practically handed victory to me! Oh no! Anyway... The divine ring allows us to repel expel which is technically an improvement over our N8 null, but it's not useful enough for us to make use of. For most of the game, I used the Phantom Ring, Protect Ring, and the aforementioned Rich Ring. The Phantom Ring, which can be found at the internment facility, and the Protect Ring, which can be bought from the shop, both give an independent stat boost to evasion and defense, respectively, while in human form. These are effectively a plus two to the given stat, making them very effective, especially since they are the only way for us to have anything resembling a buff in this run. Do note, buffs and debuffs only go up to plus 3 and minus 3 in this game. Four Sukukajas and a Sukunda would still be a plus 2, for example. So a plus 2 is basically a 66% increase to the given stat. Meanwhile, the Rich Ring I almost never took off simply because we need the money for... A ways up the tower, we come to the only large karma terminal in this area... Yeah, here before the sus impasse door, otherwise you'll get blindsided by four titans who can rough you up pretty good. If you know they're coming, they aren't that bad. A few more floors up, and we come to a small karma terminal, right before a door with your standard fair ominous boss text. Prepare for trouble! Make it double! What on earth? To protect the world from devastation. To unite all peoples within our nation. To denounce the evils of truth and love. To extend our reach to the stars above. It's Team Rocket. They're the society's elite guard. The best of the best. Their names are... Jesse! James. 
Team Rocket, blast off at the speed of light. Surrender now or prepare to fight, fight, fight. Meow, that's right. Team Rocket starts out in human form, but they aren't going to stay that way. After any one unit takes 30% of their maximum HP, they'll all transform into demon forms. Considering they have gun damage on the table, I recommend forcing the issue as quickly as possible. Once the fight actually begins, Jesse turns into Ganga and is packing dying tier skills for every element except ice. Uh, hey, game, do I need to remind you that I'm level 22? Do you think it might be a little early for Mazandine? James turns into Ibelaris, and his attacks consist entirely of physical moves. And before you get any bright counter-themed ideas, he's also completely immune to physical and gun. And Meowth turns into Q-Sith, who has Tarukaja, Makakaja, Dia, and Void skills for everything but ice. And to make matters worse, all three of them cover each other's weaknesses. Q-Sith is weak to fire, which Ganga nulls, Ganga is weak to earth, which Ubelaris nulls, and Ubelaris is weak to force, which Q-Sith nulls. So even if you've endured Gotcha Hell, you can't play to weaknesses until you drop at least one of them. Beyond the stated weakness, all three of them are immune to ice, and have an unwritten weakness to electric, which is to say they take double damage to it. But it doesn't give you an additional press turn, because DDS2 decided to make false weaknesses where the attack does more damage, but doesn't trigger a weak flag, so you don't get an extra turn. Since James Null's gun, we have to play a bit more carefully. Ganga is absolutely the priority. We want no part in dying to your skills at this level, much less AoE dying to your spells. For this, I recommend a setup of your random target units, that being Gaelus Yellow, then Surf, then Argilla. Gale will pass to Surf, who can focus Ganga along with Argilla. What Gale does depends on whether or not Surf or Argilla get a crit. If neither get a crit, pass to Surf for another shot. If only one of them crit, have Gale combo with Surf for a twin shot. If both Surf and Argilla crit, go for a crossfire. Surf is the best one to combo with due to his higher damage, but if he's low on HP, Argilla is fine. That being said, do not be afraid to use Gale's turn to heal instead. These guys don't hit like a truck, they hit like a convoy, so keep people alive more than anything else. Once Jessie goes down, the power dynamic instantly shifts into our favor. With her fire immunity off the table, Q-Sith's fire weakness is now very much on the table. Argilla and Gale's turns should now be used for spamming fire items. Volatiles are fine, but firebombs will get the job done quicker. Of course, let Argilla use the meteor items if possible to maximize damage. Once Q-Sith goes down, the only one left is Belarus, who can safely be spammed down with any combination of Force, Electric, or Almighty items of her preference. How could we have been beaten by these twerps? Quick, get into the next scene! Guys again? In a move designed only to try my patience, Team Rocket gets their refight approximately one hour after the first one. This fight has literally no difference from the fight we just did, save roughly 1,000 extra HP between the three of them and one new combo action, Bolt Rain. If they are allowed to use it, it does around two-thirds of your health and electric damage with a one-third chance to inflict stun. Of course, the key word here is if. The combo action is electric type so a bolt wall will remove it. These can be found randomly as rewards to fights, but it's not exactly a consistent drop. Of course, right now you'll probably be hitting shop rank 5, which unlocks the white loot box. In addition to including the gamble ring to widen your damage, it's also the only way to purchase wall items. So you know what that means! Thankfully, that makes this fight trivial. They'll consistently go for this on the second turn, and will do so every other turn. Stock up on bolt walls, and they'll basically only move every other turn. From there, spam them down with almighty or electric items, alongside Sif's guns to make quick work of Ganga. They can only use bolt rain if all three are alive, so after that, the fight just becomes a slower version of what we just did. Why am I not even surprised she is in here? <laughs> what? Looking for a replacement leader? Over my dead body. Speaking of... So that's heat. Guess I should have expected him to be hot. Hey kids, who's ready for another lore dump? Oh my god, no. Please give us the short version. I don't even want to hear it. Fine, jeez. So, short version. Angel tricked Loka Paula into trying to abduct Sarah because she wants to disrupt our goal of creating a society founded on demonic cannibalism. Sarah keeps us all sane, demon forms let us walk in the sun, and we farm out the rank and file as food for the rest of us. 
Makes sense. That just sounds like dictatorship with extra steps. This is a Shinigami Tensai game. What were you expecting? Actual political theory? I'm like, one step away from a literal cartoon villain. This fight starts against four guards who are, strangely, not weak to gun. Could not tell you why. Once the fight actually begins, Heat comes in as Agni, accompanied by two Gadon. I guess it's a good thing he's not on our side right now, huh? This fight actually has a unique quirk. If Suruf is in the active party, Heat will primarily focus him down. He has access to Key Blast, which is now all target, Double Slash for random target, and can take a combo action with one of the Gadon on the field for Moragi Dine for a large amount of fire damage. However, he will literally never use Baragi Dine and will only rarely use Double Slash or Key Blast so long as he can target Surf. This means running Surf actually makes Heat weaker as he'll not be doing the damage he could be doing if he were using his all target moves more often. If you weren't using Surf before, firstly, why? But more importantly, have him in and keep him topped up. Firewalls will come in handy here, occasionally stealing turns off of Heat or the Gadon. The Gadon can cast Void Ice, but are not guaranteed to and will not do so on the first turn. So spam ice items into him until they go down, and Heat will quickly follow. Following this is one forced encounter against the Rakshasha and a Bereth, which as long as you healed after Heat, I'm pretty sure you would have to try to lose. And after that, there are no encounters for the rest of the dungeon. You'll have two scripted fights against the society soldiers who tell you to hurry forward to the chief director, so we head on up to speak to an Angel. So, I take it you know I'm Sarah's mother? And her father, if I understand. Good, you're up to speed. Then I'll ask plainly. What are your intentions with my daughter? Wait, we weren't asking her we'll out. Back by hey, dessert. what you laughing at? I'm sorry, I had to. I know my little girl is growing we up. Weren't. Ah, I remember me and David's first date. Jenna, I think I'm dying. Do most of your dates end in someone dying? Only the good ones. Anyway, Sarah's in the EGG. Roland knows where that is. You can take my helicopter. Side note, I love how in every scene where the gang is flying in some aircraft, Cielo is just on the outside, flying as his form Dias. And when the helicopter gets hit, you can see Cielo just kind of, oh shit, as it goes down. I just, I love Cielo, man, he's great. Thankfully, we crash at exactly where we were going. Welcome to the EGG. Get comfortable, you'll be here a while. The first encounter of note is against Tusati. Guess what this ring does? Here's a hint. It's made from the cell data of the Lord of the Flies. Oh no! This gives us the Skull Ring, which imparts Death Repel. Useful, sure, but not as useful as anything we were already using. As for the rest of the enemies here, the combats range from laughably easy to... Any encounter against Tanki, Ose, or Skahak is just not worth taking. A lot of the enemies here also have some form of counter, so our guns have a chance to do more damage to ourselves than our enemies. But even in spite of the danger of some encounters, I recommend combing this place from top to bottom again. Treasures contain things like ammo upgrades as well as some fairly useful items. Plus we won't have the chance to later, so it's best to comb the place now. Though don't expect to find a Soma, they never appear in chests. Throughout the dungeon, you'll find doors that require you to enter in your credit card number in order to enter. Thankfully, we can mug people in the facility for theirs, and if you don't know the number, you can just check the back of the card in your inventory. That's literally the entire dungeon, and honestly, I'm all for it. Society Tower was too damn long, so I'm here for an easy one. Although, along the way... So, uh, what is that big thing? Just a second. Meganada, son of Demon King Ravana, a spirit of lightning, also known as the Undying One, and... Entrojit. You're kidding me. Yeah, let's hope we never have to deal with that thing. Anyway, steal some more credit cards, work your way to the bottom, and we hit the bottom floor, where James tells us that he fucking ate Jesse and Meowth, which is a level of deviant art I don't even want to think about. And as if to push that further, he turns into a literal mouth. Abaddon has three different forms that he can swap between using Bellow. Each form mimics the abilities of Jesse, James, or Meowth from the earlier Team Rocket fights. Yes, of the last four boss fights, Team Rocket has literally been three of them. 
the affinities of each form are mostly the same as the unit that they are based on, which does mean their false electric weakness is always an option for attacking damage on. As for what else to use, try and watch for a tell of what form he's in. Physical attacks means he's Ubelarus and is weak to force while nulling gun and earth. Magic attacks means he's Ganga and is weak to earth but nulls fire, and buffs or debuffs mean he's Q Sith and is weak to fire while nulling ice and force. He will always start the fight as Ubelarus, and their toolkits are essentially identical to what the unit had during the last fight. This might make things seem easier, since they have around the same HP between them as they did last time, but a few things make this fight more complex. The first is Vor. All three forms have the capacity to use this, and on use, it swallows the target. This essentially becomes the same fight as Rahu in DDS1. You need to deal 500 damage to him within a few turns to make him spit out the target. However, unlike Rahu, there is only one unit, which makes it significantly easier to take advantage of his weaknesses for extra press turns. The additional false weakness to Electric also makes freeing the unit much easier. If you're unable to free the units in time, they'll eventually be regurgitated at 1 HP after a few turns. If you successfully deal 500 damage, they'll be regurgitated immediately and retain their current HP. The second option is Noxious Cloud, which does severe almighty damage and also has a poison chance. This fight really isn't too crazy. The hardest part is always figuring out what he's currently weak to, and after that, it's just essentially just a matter of soloing whatever rocket front is active. I recommend succumbing to for as many fire, force, and earth items as you can grab. Electric's also an option, but those three should be your main priority. After that's done, you have the option to obtain some lore about the world, and then you can descend into the bowels of the EGG in order to pick up Sarah for the prom. Psych, I lied to you, turn the fuck around. Seraph is about to spend the year dead for tax reasons, so we need to make sure he's ready to come back. There is one skill in particular I know I want, Max Critical. Min and Max Critical increase your critical hit rate while Solar Noise is at minimum or maximum to roughly 50% respectively, something Seraph is definitely going to want. Minimum Critical is technically preferable, since you have a chance to cure all status ailments when Solar Noise hits minimum, but it's not particularly important. I went for Max Critical and never had any issues. The issue is that Max Critical is an esoteric mantra, all the way the fuck over here. As such, I started the long walk from the middle of the mantra grid all the way to the left side with all of my units. More specifically, I tried to have Gale and Surf encircle it, so they could both obtain the move once it became available. If I could been grinding in the upper floors of the EGG, the enemies here aren't as strong as those deeper in, but nearly every encounter down there has something with Fizz Resist, Counter Strike, or both, whereas up here we have weak enemies and mobs who are weak to gun. All the while, I also had every unit I could pick up level gift to try and increase the odds of finding items on level up. So after 24 hours of grinding, Seraph and Gale both learn Max Critical, and we are finally able to move on. <laughs> there are better places to take a nap than on the ground, you know. Surf! Oh, god damn it. Here, hold this. What are you doing? What's he gonna do? Stab me? Nope, alright, that's it. Wait, what? In the garbage No, wait, you go. stop. I'm not going- I'm, done I'm not you. going back in there. Come you on. let me go, sir! Go. No, 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 <laughs> no! No! Do we have a protocol for Final Fantasy XIV? I've got one! Panic! I am become death, destroyer of worlds. I'm Oberon. I'm here to teach you about this game's combo system. The Embryon aren't the only ones on the field able to perform combos. You will often see enemies do it too. For example, if one unit has Bufudine and another has Teradine, they will be able to work together to create my Bufudine. A multitude of different skills can work together to create varying effects. Let's see how much you know. If one unit has Agidine and Bufula, and another has Teradine and Zeo, 
How many combos could they perform together? That's correct! The following six skills are possible. This means that these two units together could use each other to gain a potential power boost, or farm additional turns if the opposition is weak to the attacks. Hmm? I'm sorry, I'm being told that since the Embryon cannot use elemental combos, and such unique situations do not occur with enemies, that this was completely irrelevant. Ah, <sighs> this always seems to happen to me. Still, I thank you for listening. Full Metal Alchemist So Seth is dead, and Gale assumes command of the Embryon. To stop God from deleting my save file, we need to go to the power plant and turn the computer back on. Do note, once you go inside the power plant, you will not be able to leave, so do any prep work you wish to do beforehand. That said, the encounters here aren't really that much of a concern. Most of the enemies here are trying to run strategies based on ailments, like the Spectre, who will try and mute you before going for MP Thief, since you lose a larger amount of HP or MP while muted. Since we literally don't care about our MP, Spectres are basically just an inconvenience, which is about the tone for the entire dungeon. If you've been playing along, you'll probably be so overleveled that nothing in here will be of much consequence. As for my party, I ended up going with Cielo, Gale, and Argilla. Cielo's gun gives him strong AoE potential while also still being stronger than Roland, while Argilla and Gale handle single target play. Argilla being particularly strong with magic is also useful. Roland decides that because his Atma tattoo is the lightning bolt, that means he can conduct electricity and open the gate by force of willpower alone. Which, that's bullshit, but I'll believe it. But it's the last thing he's going to get to do this game, so why not? This makes up the puzzle for the dungeon. We have to move through the area and open and close doors to make our way to various parts of the map. Make sure you loot this place from top to bottom. There's some decent ammo options you can pick up, as well as a strength boosting data. Don't be afraid to use items, either. The only shop the game provides to you at this point is in the front of the dungeon. So if you're too deep, it might be easier to just use what you have. Items like the odd morsel and rancid gravy become tempting as they restore a large amount of HP, but have the chance to poison and mute you, respectively. That said, they can still be useful as out-of-battle healing as long as you have the curing items to mitigate it. This leads us to the first of a series of three bosses. Door with Guns Door with Guns consists of a door with two guns. That's the name. The laser cannons have named variants of all medium damage elemental spells, and basically nothing else. They resist gun, which makes logical sense, I suppose, but are weak to electric. That being said, I don't recommend going too hard with electric items here. These guns don't do that much damage, so you can mitigate it while you slowly whittle them down with non-electric items. The reason I say to save your electric items is for the second boss, Door with Guns 2. Door with Guns 2 consists of a door with two guns. The 20mm machine guns are actually extremely difficult to deal with for us. Similar to Door with Guns 1, they resist gun and are weak to electric, but this time, they're packing actual gunfire. In fact, all of their attacks are gun elements. Our one singular weakness. Fire is a weak single target shot with 30% chance to apply a random ailment. Sharp Shot is a medium single target shot that is undodgeable and has a guaranteed crit rate, and Barrage is 4 to 8 hits of weak gun damage to random targets. Barrage can especially fuck you up, doing 60 to 90 per hit depending on who it hits. Considering our max HP hovers in the 350s, this can very easily drop somebody if you roll unlucky. And it being a weakness means that they'll be getting extra turns every turn. This is the fight I recommend using electric items on. In fact, if you have enough shock bombs, I honestly just recommend the everything in the kitchen sink strategy and have everyone lob everything at them. If you really want to play conservatively, you can alternate between electric items and any non-earth element, but personally, I wanted this fight done as quickly as possible. The final fight on our list of three is Door with Guns 3. No guesses as to what this fight consists of. This fight has a bit more to it, because in this one, the door also joins in. One of the guns is a machine gun, and one of the guns is a laser gun, and both sport an extra 600 HP, while the core above them sports 3300. The core will start closed, in which it resists all elements and nulls fizz and gun. It'll spend the first couple of turns doing nothing, and then load in ammunition. Afterwards, it'll open up, and then fire the flare cannon, a severe damage all-target fire move capable of over 200 damage to all of our targets. Only while the core is open are we capable of dealing any adequate damage. But that's the least of our concerns right now. 
The largest concern is the beefed up machine gun, which can now sharp shot for 250 fucking damage. The laser cannon is no slouch either, capable of some meaty elemental damage at this point. I recommend the same strategies we used on door with guns too, that being kitchen sink. The less time these things are alive, the better. I hope you have enough attack items to burst them all down, because if you don't... Once the laser machine guns are down, the core will enter genocide mode. Hey yo, what the fuck? In which it uses flare cannon every single turn. If you have firewalls, use them to keep yourself alive while you whittle down the remainder of its HP. After a while though, you'll open up the final door to the final boss of the area, Raja Naga with a couple of Naga minions. This fight is actually easier than the doors that came before it. It consists initially of three Naga, followed up by two more and a Raja Naga commander. The Naga each have 660 HP, so they'll drop pretty easily to fire spam. They can cast Void Fire, but they don't always do so, and they do so even less if one of the units misses. Raja Naga also largely prefers to summon reinforcements if he can, as he wants to go for his combo move, Conviction. If two Naga are alive, your entire team can spend all of their actions to hit your entire party with mega physical damage, which also instant kills any muted targets. However, if you keep up the pressure with firebombs, there shouldn't be enough Naga alive for him to get this off, and you can easily get through this encounter without ever seeing him use it. Now we have steps from the power plant controls, Angel decides to release that Meganata creature we saw back in the EGG and use it to try to break through Roland's forces. Thankfully, Adil and the Lokapala have been holding off the entire society by themselves thus far, so everything should be fine. So, what's the plan now? Let me handle this. Let old Roland get some action. Roland, that thing just killed your entire defensive line. Don't be stupid. Just go kill the power. Everything will be fine. Everything is not fine. God damn it! Where are you? Are you alright? What should we do? In order. Outside the hall. No. And... No. 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 Hello. Goodbye. How fast can you get out of here? What? I'm about to overload the power. We'll turn this place into a damn bomb. What? No! This is not up for debate. Get out of here now! I did absolutely nothing this entire run. Hello? Hello? I can do this. Goodbye. Goodbye. I just have to blow myself up. I guess this is what heat felt like. Amid everything falling apart, Argilla somehow cries so hard that Sarah manages to awaken to Surf's Atma Avatar, gaining the power of Surf's Water Crown. Following this, Argilla decides that she's going to help roll- Wait, she's going to do what? She's going to do what? Just get Sarah out of here. Everything is going to be fine. Everything is not fine! Why did I think this was a good idea? I'm going to die. Goodbye. All right, that's enough of this. Nobody got that last joke anyway. From here, Sarah assumes the leadership of the Embryon and properly joins the party. Sarah is somewhat unique in that her starting stats and learned skills are whatever serfs were at the time of death, with some slight stat boosts for however many levels you obtained at the power plant. This effectively doubles the value of every stat boosting data you gave to Surf. That said, Sarah will still decide her own level ups like any other party member, and she tends to favor magic, which is something I certainly won't turn down. But most importantly, Sarah also wields a pistol, which has the exact same stats as Surf's, meaning we still have a strong single target unit and one that comes preloaded with max critical. This means Sarah immediately comes in goaded with the sauce, which we'll be taking full advantage of. After a brief visit to- We stop by this pyrojack who tells us that he also conducts serious business. For 50 grand, he'll sell you an impel stone, which is the one-time use of SMT Nocturne's Dragon Eye, providing you four additional actions for the price of one. The downside is that he'll only ever sell you one. 
he will not sell you another until you use the one you have. That said, this isn't too much of a concern. As much as infinite turns would certainly be nice, I doubt we'll ever need that to win a fight. Foreshadowing is a literary device and after this we return to the EGG so that Sarah can politely ask God not to delete the planet. Johnny is kind enough to offer us some life advice and the fact that the dungeon is now a lot shittier. The shop now begins selling core shields and light balls, both of which will help below. The opening segment where we grind it is now pitch black, limiting our minimap and guaranteeing that we will start every fight with the enemy taking the first turn. Light balls will prevent this, so use them to get down to the lower levels. You know, off topic, one thing that I like is that Sarah closes one eye when she fires her pistol, which is actually a common bad habit among novices. It's a neat detail that makes her look visibly less practiced when compared to the other party members. Moving into the EGG proper, shit is fucked. People are fused into walls, bridges are broken, and there are now portals lining the entire area. This turns the EGG into this game's first instance of everyone's favorite Atlas trope, the teleporter dungeon. Admittedly, the teleporters aren't the worst part of this dungeon. That would be the enemies. Many of the enemies now hit significantly harder or have stronger moves. Hanuman with high counter, Legion with gun resist, Hecaton Kairos with both, Loa with debilitate, and Death March, a kamikaze style move that will deal 2 to 5 random hits of severe almighty damage to random targets. The works. Everything in here is out to kill you, so doing any grinding here is going to be significantly more difficult. Something not at all helped by how common a lot of these enemies are in scripted fights. Thankfully, we're now high enough level that even the enemies with gun resistance are still taking pretty solid damage from us. Anyway, This awards us the Dragon Ring, and if you thought this was going to be another dud like the other DDS1 rings, you're dead wrong. Beating Long Long Gaming last run gives us a ring which imparts almighty resistance, something we cannot obtain by any other means. This is a huge boon, as it'll allow us to resist some of the game's hardest hitting attacks. We won't use it all the time, simply because almighty isn't always a concern, but when it is, we'll definitely keep it in mind. As for the rest of this area, you can either grind now or later. The teleporters will vanish after beating the boss of this area, which will make it significantly easier to traverse, while also allowing you to pick up any items you missed during the last EGG visit. There's a pretty decent karma rings too, so it's not a bad idea to try it now, but it's also not a bad idea to wait. The enemies can be a bit of a problem. Some have counter, the Hanuman can charm you with Sakura Rage, Saka can mute you with Silent Howl, which you would expect they would have given him a stun move like Neural Shock or Mind Scream, but you should still be overleveled from your last EGG visit that nothing here is too difficult. After long last, we make our way to the bottom of the facility. Since we have max critical, walk around until it's at max solar noise before you go in. Make sure not to mistime your walk and accidentally walk it over to 7 8 solar noise instead. I've done that plenty and having to grind out an entire noise cycle is annoying. But once you're ready, open the door. Well, well, well. Here to take out the garbage. Hey, I know you're upset, but just please let me talk to God and we can- God doesn't want to talk to you anymore. You treated me like a joke, cast me aside, and now, oh, now I'm stronger than all of you! It's garbage day, motherfuckers! Pete has fused with the garbage can to become Vitra, and has come seeking revenge for how we treated him last run. Which is my explanation for why this boss is the literal antithesis to the entire run! Every single thing, and I do mean every single thing that could possibly be stacked against us here, is. This is the hardest fight in the entire run, and it's not even the final boss. Vitra technically only has 3080 HP, which might seem low for this fight, but that's only the HP for the body. Both of Vitra's tentacle arms have 500 HP each, and will block for the body so long as one of them are alive. The way they do this is somewhat interesting. If the attack is single target, like Sarah's pistol, the attack will be redirected to a random living arm. If the attack is all target, such as an attack item, then the body will simply be ignored, as though it wasn't a target at all. Random target attacks, like Gale and Cielo guns, also work this way, 
which is actually inconvenient. Say Gale's gun, which hits two to five times on random targets, would hit an arm once and the body twice. Because the game handles random target moves this way, the two hits on the body just cease to exist. This puts us at a disadvantage right out the gate, since two out of our three units basically have no good way to deal damage outside of items. Speaking of items, the tentacles will only block damage if Vitra would actually take damage. So while the tentacles do take ice damage, because Vitra himself repels ice damage, they'll just let that shit bounce right back at you. This alongside Vitra's fire absorb and all parts of Vitra being immune to earth, basically means only three types of items will have any effect at all. Electric, Force, and Almighty. The body is weak to electric, but the tentacles are not, so you'll need to drop them before you do anything else. And speaking of the tentacles, they will be attacking you with weak physical hits, single and all targets, each turn that they are alive. And after both of them go down, a few turns later, Vitro will just regenerate his fucking arms like he's Piccolo! That is the real kicker. Vitra having two 500 HP arms means that he actually has roughly 4,000 HP, at minimum. Every single time Vitra regenerates his arms, that's another 1,000 HP he's putting on the board. Every. Single. Time. He truly learned from stalling Metatron for 90 minutes, because unlike every other boss in the game, he is actually capable of stalling us out. And we haven't even talked about his fucking moves yet! The body gets two actions, so he'll get four press turns. The body itself will cast Power Wave and Silent Howl for medium damage, and is also capable of Sonic Wave. While Mute isn't any big deal, Panic beats Mute, so we are always at risk of getting panicked, which might make someone accidentally transform into a demon. He's also packing every debuff in the game, which just makes matters even more fun. But the two major kickers are his unique moves. While the tentacles are alive, he can use Galen Torrent, an undodgeable, heavy damage, all-target ice attack with a 35% chance of freeze. 35% per person means Heat has a 73% chance to freeze at least one person. And if that happens, the tentacles will focus fire on that unit, effectively giving them 2-3 more actions per turn, and almost definitely killing that target. And while the tentacles are dead, he also has a chance to open his turn with Inferno Roar a mega damage almighty attack that is also undodgeable. When I say everything is against you in this fight, I mean it. Gale and Cielo don't have a viable basic attack, so we need to gotcha for specific element items to play the fight out. Items which Vitra will block until his tentacles go down, which he will revive over and over and over, while he spams attacks and debuffs down your throat for roughly half of your HP every fucking turn. One attempt can take upwards of 45 minutes, and it can go down the drain at any point because Heat just decided you lose. This fight sucks. And underscoring the ass whooping you're receiving is literally the best track in the entire fucking game. trying for around 6 hours and getting nowhere, I decided to grind for money. Not for items, uh, okay, yes, kinda of for items, but more importantly, for the graven image. Yeah, that infinite use diorama item that we got for Beazelbub last run, yeah, we're getting it now. This gives us enough stall power to outlast the stall being thrown at us. Go over your units and see who has the best magic stat. Diorama still scales off the unit's magic, so that unit should be the one using the Graven Image the most. I also recommend a healthy supply of medical kits, if not their upgrade medical tools, for the group heals of 150 and 300 each, as well as as many Panacea as you can carry. It might not cure Freeze, but it does deal with the panic off of Sonic Wave. Furthermore, this is the first time Karma Rings are actually genuinely important for our strategy. The Phantom and Protect Rings are definitely worthwhile considerations, and personally, I use both. Plus 2 to Defense can potentially allow a unit to survive a hit that would have killed them, and plus 2 to Evasion can potentially throw off Heat's Rhythm by causing him to miss, allowing you to make space and counterattack. The Dragon Ring is just also a generally good choice, as all Mighty Resistance helps you deal with Inferno Roar, which is Heat's hardest hitting attack by far. However, the Heho Ring that we got all the way back at the start of the game is also a useful option that I didn't consider until well after I finished the run, as it hard stops Galen Torrent, which costs him turns and also makes follow-up attacks from the arms less likely. 
or at least less painful. Shout out to Deus for that idea. And if any unit gets debuffed too much, don't be afraid to let them die. We don't have any reserve party members to do rotations with right now, so the only way we have to cleanse debuffs is via death. If a unit has low HP and is already minus 3 to Rakunda or Sukunda, it can be more worth it to just take the death rather than using items to try and keep them alive. Having Cielo heal is usually the best strategy, as Sarah and Gale are your highest damage dealers. But whether or not the situation calls for a medical tool or graven image spam is something you'll have to decide on the fly. Keep your health topped up, keep tossing items, and eventually, you'll send heat back where he belongs. How are you doing? I don't care who the IRS sends, so I'm not paying taxes. Do not worry. I am simply here to inform you that you have died. Wait, really? I thought I was faking it. Oh no, dead as shit. That man punched a hole in your chest. Damn. Why is your right ear white? Let's go to space. Oh, okay. Do you like it? Sure. Would you like some exposition? <sighs> So you see absolutely nothing wrong with destroying the health of a child. Appeal to emotion. Like hell we're doing that joke again. If we let ourselves get stopped by what is humane, science could not progress. I intend to pump her full of every chemical imaginable until she has God around her pretty little finger. So you're telling me I was basically an irredeemable bastard? The original you, yes. And Heat had her best interests at heart? In his own way. So this is basically coordinate 136 from the last game. Oh, you're familiar. Then I can skip ahead. That's enough. I am not about to sit here and let you torture a child so you could experiment and play God. You turn that machine off right now, or so help me, Annabella. I will kill you myself. I'll torture a thousand children before I let this experiment die, and I'll silence anyone who gets in my- Oh. Camera's on. Seeing you kill Heat, God cursed the world. Seeing Heat kill you, God gave up. And yet, you remain. That means all is not lost. You have the soul of your original, and the mind Sarah gave you. From that, you are your own. You. I had the power of God in my hands, and you stole it from me. Our time is over. Have you forgotten? This is a challenge run. No demons. You fool. This is a cutscene. It doesn't count. Cutscenes don't count. Defeat these phantoms and reclaim your position. As leader of the Embryon. Unable to dodge taxes any longer, Surf is forced back into the encounter for a 2v2. Fortunately, he's not alone. Heat O'Brien is given a unique form of Agni with fairly high power fire and physical skills, along with strong healing magics. The downside is, well, all of the demon going on. Sadly, O'Brien lacks a human form to revert into but thankfully can be dismissed. So we can simply pass Surf's first turn to him, go into the member menu, and have him withdraw and let us handle it. How difficult real and fake Varna can be largely depends on RNG. Neither are particularly complex, having no affinities to speak of and only one move besides their basic attack. Real Varna will curse at Heat before casting Black Impulse, a heavy death-based attack. 
Inversely, Fake Varna will long for Sarah before casting White Impulse, a heavy expel-based attack. The more Fake Varna uses White Impulse, the better, as our expel immunity ends their turn right away, while also negating any would-be crits from real Varna. I tried to give Surf the Skull Ring we got for defeating Beazelbub, which would have given him Repel Death, but sadly, whatever Karma Ring Surf had on is removed when he dies. To help mitigate this, we come in fully prepared. Surf retains whatever bullets and skills he had active when he died, so you'll want to prepare him for this fight prior to his death in EGG1. That's why we spent 24 hours grinding Max Critical. Counter is also extremely useful here, as it gives us a good chance to turn one of their many physical hits into free damage. That said, this fight still could have been tricky, if not for one crucial thing that I actually had it planned for. The Graven Image. Surf's inventory is the same as whatever the Embryon was when they beat Vitra. This means that my decision to buy the Graven Image to help with Vitra gives Surf a reusable 250 HP heal. Considering that without crits, the Varnas deal roughly 150 damage, this basically makes Surf unkillable. Get out of my way, you imposter. Each of the Varnas have 1600 HP. So between your item spam and counter hits slowly whittling them down, there's really nothing either of them can do to stop you. As long as you've prepared for this fight and keep yourself topped up using items, you can tap the fight in and beat Persona 4 in no time at all. At which point, the game dumps a truckload of EXP on you. This should be more than enough to get set up to match the levels that the Embryon got while he was gone. Hey guys. Surf's up. Surf! How long were you waiting to make that joke? <laughs> Since I died. Yeah, okay, fair. Anyway, see you at the end of the game. Sarah tells the gang that even though they can't call God on Discord anymore, they might still be able to send him a fax if they can get to the Heart Facility in Alaska. So the gang sets off at the airport in order to show God some jam and Latin rhythm. Although, not quite yet. You see, beating the second EGG visit unlocks one of this game's few true side quests. By talking to this guy inside the EGG and having Gale play Phoenix right with him, we discover that the four Archangels from Shin Megami Tensei 2 somehow wound up here five years ago after Old Surf nearly got everyone killed. This unlocks three additional boss fights. Uriel within the EGG, where we fought Abaddon, Gabriel atop the Society Tower, where we first fought Team Rocket, and Raphael in the internment facility, where we made the poisoned food. This is optional, but, I mean, come on, you guys know me. Uriel himself doesn't have too much to speak of. He's weak to ice, absorbs fire, and is immune to earth, but he's thankfully not resistant to gun. He has a combination of fire and electric attacks to keep damage on the board, but doesn't bring too much else to the table. Outside of Judgment, a mega all-target fire move that also debuffs defense. But even then, you should have the HP to tank this. So instead, I'll talk about the biggest buff that we've received. Two main characters. Because Sarah starts with the same build Seraph had, she is effectively another Seraph. Thus, when Seraph comes back, we have two Seraphs both of which have max critical and counter attacks. This basically makes any physical attacks a very good way for an opponent to kill themselves, while also giving Gale two very effective units to combo off of. Or you can have both Seraphs take care of business themselves. Gabriel is a bit trickier. She's weak to force, but packs a large array of ailment skills to give you issues. The only one that isn't a pain in the neck to deal with is Silent Howl, which deals mute damage and has a chance to, well, mute. Centaur food deals panic, which can make a unit uncontrollable and prone to throwing away money or transforming into a demon. Neural Shock can inflict stun, which dumps your accuracy and defense. Fatal Charm charms, which makes the unit uncontrollable and prone to shooting an ally. And Wicked Curse inflicts curse. 
which increases the chance of Mudo spells working and also makes it so all damage dealt by the cursed target is reflected back at them. Her unique skill, Heavenly Smile, also has an 80% chance to inflict charm or curse. Curse can make counters worse for you than they are for her, and curse has the highest priority among all ailments. So if you would be afflicted with curse, you are going to be. Assuming you have the Skull Ring, I highly recommend it here, as it deals with both curse and Mamudun. As for the other ailments, if you've gone deep enough into the ailment mantras to unlock null for any of those types, I would recommend them here. Ultimately, this one is going to come down to getting lucky enough for her to let you shoot her. If you're still cursed coming out of this fight, you can just heal it at any large karma terminal. It's the cheapest ailment to heal by far. Lastly is Raphael, who is weak to electric. He actually has quite a large number of physical skills, so counter will likely be very live here. The biggest issues are debilitate, along with his unique move, Winged Fury. Winged Fury is 2-4 random hits of Mega Force damage that also debuffs Evasion and Accuracy by one stage on hit. Though thankfully, it can never debuff you by more than one stage per attack. Unlike Uriel debuffing defense, this can be a bit of an issue. Defense nerfs can be mitigated with heal spam, but accuracy nerfs are a little more annoying. A Graven Image came in very handy here, as well as multiple all-target healing items. Don't be afraid to let a unit go down if it means cleansing them of debuffs. Losing a turn can be worth it if it means you get to pick them back up and more ready to fight. Four units also means that we are now capable of party rotations again, so you can also dispel buffs that way as well. After all three Archangels are defeated, one final fight opens up. And wouldn't you know it, hits back in our old hell, the Occupied Sector. In this one, all three Archangels are now accompanied by Michael, and we are forced to take on all four back to back to back to back. The order of the Archangels is consistent. Uriel into Raphael into Gabriel into Michael. The first three fights are identical to their initial appearances, though them coming without a break does change things somewhat. Uriel's judgment debuffing your defense can mean you'll be softened up going into Raphael, which can make for a nasty combo with Winged Fury. More than ever, do not be afraid to take ways to remove debuffs, whether that's a party rotation or taking a death. Furthermore, the Phantom and Protect Rings will come in very handy here for the purposes of mitigating the debuffs. You wouldn't think a plus two would matter much, but the sheer amount of dodges I got out of this fight would say otherwise. Furthermore, bring in a healthy stock of Ice, Force, and Electric items. Utilize Gale's higher magic stat to have him heal and cast spells for turn economy, while you have Seraph and Sarah crit fish with their guns. If either of them succeed, go for a twin shot or, God willing, a crossfire. That said, this will largely come down to luck, because between the debuffs and the status, there's a lot of things in this fight that can just decide to kill you. After significant effort and one hell of a grind session, I came back and took the fight again. This time, I came in stacked to the nines. Null Panic, Counter and Counter Strike for a 70% counter chance, Critical and Max Critical, and finally, the Revival Orb, an infinite use full revive. This is the last major upgrade we are going to get, and the fact that we're getting it before the end of the game is still kind of alarming. <laughs> and this allowed me to finally make it to Michael. Dare you not think this man is anything like his subordinates. Unlike every other boss so far, he has no weakness to speak of, and unlike the other Archangels, who have 3,500, he's packing a solid 5,000. The good news is that while Michael has access to single and random target spells for every single element, he tends to favor physical attacks like Bloodbath and Demon Rage. This is good for us, since it means we have a very high chance to proc counters off of him. So that 5000 HP isn't going to feel as large as it sounds. He is packing Vanity though, so there is always the potential for him to cause you problems via inconsistent statuses. Once you push him low enough, he'll break out the big guns with Ragnarok, a physical almighty attack which debuffs defense on all targets, and his ultimate move, Omnipotence. 2-4 severe physical attacks to random targets with an obscene crit rate that also inflicts debilitate on hit. This is probably the silliest move in the entire game, just on account of how many things it does. And not to mention, he also has power and mind charge, so if he uses power charge with omnipotence, you're probably losing at least one character. While the Protect Ring and Phantom Ring are amazing, I highly recommend Huang Long's Dragon Ring for your third ring. The power of Michael's almighty attacks is simply too high to handle by any other means. It is way too easy for him to kill you without it. But thanks to the Graven Image, Revival Orb, and all of our defensive options, 
After way too much time, we finally send the gank squad back to their own game. <laughs> Beating these guys unlocks the Dragon Slayer Mantra, a unique mantra which provides Fire of Sinai and Divine Light. Whoa! This is worthless. It's less than worthless, my boy. Now finally heading to the airport, we tell Fred he's not allowed to go on the suicide mission because someone has to be here to make sure humanity doesn't blow themselves up afterwards. In spite of the relatively powerful enemies inside the airport, there aren't really too many issues to deal with. We're finally strong enough that even enemies with physical resistance don't trouble us much anymore, and we have more than enough resources to last through the fights on healing alone. Even most of the scripted encounters aren't worth talking about, albeit with one exception. We swear by the Amala Rain, came to us by the technical director that we will retrieve the Cyber Shaman, even if we become fiends ourselves. What, you waiting for a bit? Nah, this fight's rough. The Amala Ring gives them the weaker half of Demi Fiend's Masakados Nakatama, giving them a plus 10 to all stats. This makes them hit significantly harder, dodge more often, take less damage, and crit noticeably more. Every other DDS1 ring fight was basically of no significance, but Demi Fiend manages to get one last lick in on us by buffing this encounter real hard. That said, even buffed, this encounter isn't impossible. They like to waste turns casting Spell Gloom to debuff our magic attack, the one stat we literally don't use, and the Amala Ring doesn't give them the good part of Masakados, so they're still more than susceptible to getting shot in the face by Charm Bullets, and, moreover, any magic attack items. So, uh... Oh no! Anyway... A bit further in, we have to fight Chernobog, whom I managed to take advantage of by complete coincidence. Chernobog's main strategy is to recreate Persona 4. I am the shadow. The true self. These shadow clones copy the skills of the targeted units, but lack any of the passives on those units. This means that the shadow cells are actually completely gimped, due to the fact that our builds consist of literally only passives. This forces them to spam non-crit boosted basic attacks, triggering our counters while never being able to proc their own. Once the shadows go down, Chanabog will actually start attacking on his own, but since his attacks are almost entirely physical, he'll practically be begging you to shoot him in the face. The final boss is Kartikeya, who can largely be described as... <laughs> on the plus side, he's weak to gun, but after not too long, he'll ride the wind, which gives him an 80% bonus to his evasion. All of your attacks will have 20% of the hit chance that they usually would until you manage to hit him with something. This fight is the literal opposite of fun, and comes down to when is the game going to let the fight end? After this, we hit the point of no return. If you're missing any karma rings, now is your last chance to double check, as once we talk to Gale, we will head off to the last plane. Angel tries to stop us, but Gale decides to try to talk Angel down on his own. So, we know the data of those who died five years ago was used in the junkyard. Yes. And that I was created using David as a base. It would seem so. And his soul now rests within me. Right. So, how you doing? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's... Uh, Hey bro, we got company. Cielo, do not. Hey sister, it's okay. The embryon's color, the color on my waist, on Gail's hood, on Argila's skirt. It stands for victory. We stand for victory. Besides, the video ain't over yet. I'll see you again. Wait, what are you talking about? Oops, gotta go. <laughs> what do you think the odds of us getting out of this without dying is? Considering the last two scenes, zero. But on the plus side, we all die tomorrow anyway, so... Oh, that's fair.
just like Sonic Adventure 2. Want to do live and learn? <laughs> All right. Was that live and loan just now? Fuck. That aside, congratulations. Your pronouns are now they them. Not because you are non-binary, but because you are literally two people. This unlocks the final dungeon of the game, the sun itself, as we have to talk to God in order to convince him to spare humanity. And with us are all the spirits of our fellow party members to see us along our final endeavor. It is at this point that the game gives you certain rewards based upon how you answer certain dialogues throughout the course of both games. For not betraying the Maribel last game, Janana passes the power of her Aurora Atma to her girlfriend, unlocking Seraph Lore for Argilla, an expel skill with a 100% chance to reduce the HP of all enemies by 80% of their current total, so long as they don't resist expel. For transferring a Digital Devil Saga one save at all, Lupa provides Gale with the power of the Lava Flow Atma, Pira Phlegathon, a 200 base power all-target fire attack. This is tied for the hardest hitting attack in the game, and it's tied with our next reward. For telling Madame Cuvier to pound sand back before the first heat fight, Angel provides Seraph with the power of her Maelstrom Atma, giving them the power of Reincarnation, the strongest almighty attack at 200 base power. And finally, for refusing to fight Heat atop coordinate 136, saying the circumstances of your existence don't matter in Ajna, telling Heat that you're still comrades after he stabs you in the EGG, and saying that you see where he stands after Surf's resurrection, Roland will bow out for the final dungeon, allowing Heat to finally reassume his role amongst the Embryon. <gasps> Every skill we just got is an active skill, making them completely worthless for this run, and some guides actually suggest that Heat's grenade launcher is slightly weaker than Roland's shotgun, meaning that for all of our efforts in answering the dialogue correctly, we didn't just get nothing, we have been actively downgraded. Well, fuck this fucking game. You know what? Fuck it. I'm using Heat anyway. Get out of there. Thankfully, not everything is a complete downgrade. Argilla rejoins the team, ensuring we have at least two single target gunners, but more importantly, we unlock Seraph. Seraph's stats are equal to the highest value for each stat between Surf and Sarah. To complement this, I recommend diversifying Surf as Sarah as much as possible for as long as you have them, to make the most coked out Seraph possible. In addition, Seraph's gun is the strongest option we have access to, being a bit stronger on average compared to Surf or Sarah. Give Seraph your best ammo instantly. It is the easiest boost to damage you can obtain. Just like Sasrara last game, the Sun is a long dungeon with a lot of forced encounters that can pretty easily be bowled through. As such, we're only going to cover the bosses again, who should look quite familiar. All of the solo data of the tribe leaders from DDS1 act as the bosses here, with the exception of Janana and Lupa. Up first is Hayagriva, which... <laughs> <laughs> no. The wielder of the Burning Stake, Atma, is practically identical to his original fight. He does have Psycho Rage for more actions now, and he has upgraded Void Ice to Ice Drain, 
But beyond that, the only difference is that Skiwa and Firestorm now do late game level damage. Hayakuiba takes us around roughly the same amount of time as he did in DDS1. <laughs> Up next is a fight I was not expecting to be as difficult as it was. Our fourth encounter with Kamazots. The final iteration of the Bearer of the Sonic Wave Atma is the most difficult version of his fight. Bat's guard only lasts for one hit like in his first encounter, so we can't take advantage of Earth items this time, though he is thankfully weak to electric while he is flying now. The difficult part comes from everyone's favorite semantics nightmare, Zotzalaha Bane, and it's been upgraded. Bat starts using this move much sooner than he did last fight, and its force weakness has been upgraded from times 2 damage to times 10. Even if you have resist force, a force attack to a batted target is guaranteed lethal. Furthermore, there was an aspect of bat form that I had actually missed last game. In DDS1, bat form reduced your maximum HP by 33%. You can actually see this in the video itself. When Surf gets hit by the move, he takes the initial damage and then has his HP reduced further. I just didn't notice because going from around 330 to 295, I didn't notice the change in HP. But I sure notice it now! Ooh. In DDS2, your maximum HP is now cut in half. So a batted target literally cannot have enough HP to live a force hit. And even physical hits still do increased damage, so it's not like mitigating force will get us out of this. And last but not least, just like last game, reverting out of bat form automatically puts you into demon form. And unlike last game, where he only had around 1300 HP and could be burst down before this became an issue, he now has 5000 HP. This means that even if we correctly predict when a unit will transform back into demon form, we also need to predict whether a bat will use Winds of Hell and use a Wind Wall, or a Spiral Viper and use an Attack Mirror. And if we're wrong, demon forms will take damage, which is less damage than we'd have taken in human form, meaning the run is invalidated. I could just relent on demon forms taking damage. I could just force myself to make a dozen coin flips in a row, and I was about to do that until I remembered I still had one solution. Null physical. Buried deep in the mantra grid on the destroyer mantra, costing 1.5 million dollars per unit. If I have that, I can block Spiral Viper innately, allowing myself to spam wind walls while somebody is in bat form to avoid taking any demon based damage. Now you might think being immune to every single attack Kamazots could throw at us would make him laughably easy. And you'd be right! After making sure to listen to the raps of the solids Hee Ho Brothers one final time, we backtrack to the start of the floor to encounter Jack Frost. Throughout the entire game, Jack Frost will pop up when a random encounter would and ask you trivia questions. These questions pertain to the game's characters, lore, mechanics, and even miscellaneous trivia beats. Answering correctly will have him toss you an item with his left hand. Wrong answers make him leave, but as long as you answer his final question correctly, he'll give you a certificate, which allows you to fight him here on the sun. If you're wondering what the answers are, don't worry, I've hidden all of them somewhere in this video. Jack Frost may not be a fiend anymore, but don't let that nether race fool you. He's packing a simple but effective strategy. At the start of his turn, he'll take one of two combos. If nobody on your team knows ice, he'll open up with breath, a single target severe ice attack which hits one to two times and will always freeze. He follows this up with Psycho Rage, then makes four basic attacks to kill the target guaranteed. If you do know Ice, he instead spams Megidola. Thankfully, defeating Bat indirectly gave us our way of defeating him. Before I went and grinded up Null Physical, I was trying to predict Spiral Viper and Winds of Hell with attack mirrors and wind walls. And while that strategy didn't work, it did require me to grind up a bunch of attack mirrors, all of which I still had on hand. Freeze does trump Null Physical, but does not trump Repel Physical. And since Jack Frost will always go for breath if he is able, we can all but completely brick him by using an attack mirror every single turn, causing him to get reflected every single turn. We then heal off the damage and keep swinging with fire items until this snowman is melted to the puddle for a last time. And your reward for it is twofold. First is the Magatama ammo, the best ammo from the last game, with a 200 base power. Second is the pass range. 
which allows the wearer to pass a turn for no action cost. We give this to Heat, so we only need to take actions with Seraph or Argilla, unless we need him to heal or something. Following this, we move forward and refight Rahu, who uses the same strategy he did last time. Thankfully, the strategy we used last time also still works. Whoever isn't Seraph or Argilla becomes a priority target for Rahu to absorb, so that the two of them can focus fire the body with guns and fire items, respectively. But if someone else gets taken, it's not a big deal. Once the body goes down, the head will soon follow, and the sun sets on the bearer of the solar eclipse at night. <laughs> Lastly is Colonel Beck, who, uh, uh, is shockingly simple. Since Sarah's no longer here, and we didn't bring any spare clothes for Argilla to dress up again, Ravana just no longer has Hunger Wave. Bereft of his gimmick, Ravana is reduced to a fairly generic slugger. Sure, he hits hard and heavily resists physical and gun and packs magic propel, but his turbulence atma gives him nothing unique that we need to consider a play around. And we're so strong at this point that there's really nothing to stop us from just bursting him down with items. So, with every boss refight done, we can officially move on to the final bosses of the- Wait, who did I forget? Hello? Goodbye. Neganada is the final roadblock between us and God, and he's no pushover, let me tell you. Neganada swaps between two separate phases, physical phase and a magic phase. In the physical phase, he has exclusively physical attacks, which... thanks, Bat. However, he also is immune to gun, and absorbs electric. So throw any non-electric attack items you have him to get through his phase. After some time, he'll cast Black Bakhti, a unique move which telegraphs one of his two super moves. In physical phase, this is Virage Blade, which hits two to four times on random targets for severe physical almighty damage. Considering this is the only threat in this phase, you should be able to take it, but if somebody drops, pick them back up with a revival orb. Once he uses this, he'll use Muksha to swap to his magic phase. In this phase, he is now immune to all magic except electric, which he still absorbs, so swap to guns with Seraph and Argilla. I also recommend giving Seraph the Synchro Ray, which you can find on the floor before this fight. It'll reduce the turn cost of combo Seraph starts by 1, meaning they can cast Twin Shot with Argilla for massive damage by only spending 1 press turn. With Heat's Pass Ring, you can fire off a Twin Shot, pass to Argilla, pass to Seraph, and then fire another 3 times in a row. Or if you use Heat to heal, heal after the second Twin Shot. Healing should largely be Heat's job. Medical items heal the entire party for a static amount, and the Graven Image will be healing for around 300 no matter who uses it, so Heat can still act as a support unit in spite of his dog shit magic stat. After a while, Meganata will use Black Bakhti again. In this phase, this will be followed up by Meru Thunder, an electric attack that just does a shitload of damage. Thankfully, it is exclusively electric, meaning a bolt wall completely shuts it down. Magic Mirror also technically shuts it down, but it'll heal Meganata, so don't bother. Bring plenty of Bolt Balls. We do not want to get hit by Meru Thunder under any circumstances. This fight is slow and largely revolves around chipping Meganata's HP down while you keep yourself alive. If you are caught sleeping, you will die. Once Meganata's HP is in the red, he'll get more aggressive, going for Black Bakhti more often. On this run, I got him really close, but after how aggressive he was playing, I got a bad feeling about the next turn. So I elected to toss up a Bolt Wall for safety, only for my suspicions to be proven entirely correct when he used Black Bakhti into Meru Thunder on the same turn. If I hadn't done that, I would have died. But thankfully, one clever play means that I was able to keep throwing damage at Meganata until there was nothing there. I love you. I love you. I love you. With that, there are no more bosses left on the main path. We arrive to the Lotus Flower, and are able to ascend it to speak to God. I know, I know you're, you're here, God, you big fucking nerd. nerd. Where's my goddamn, goddamn money?
are they talking? They are speaking the language of the gods. They have such a way with words. Ramen, the final fight. The final thing standing between us and God pulling an Elden Ring. And in order to stop him, we have to endure a five-phase piss kicker of a fight. Phase 1 through 4 only have 300 HP, and see Brahmin transition through various forms of elemental damage. These four phases see him using one of his many unique moves, simply called Light. Light is a physical almighty attack, and while it's not all that strong, it is all target, and seems to have a boosted critical rate. However, physical almighty is physical enough for us to use counter. Every time he uses Light, any units with both counter and counter strike will have a 70% chance to counter attack and this goes up to 88% chance if you have high counter on top of that. This additional damage is very useful, so I recommend giving counter skills to everyone who has them. Only Seraph had high counter, so for everyone else, I ran life gain to boost their HP to Seraph's level. As for the rest of my skills, I used critical and max critical to give everyone a very high crit chance with their guns. I also used life surge to get everyone's HP into the 900s, and null nerve because it's the only status ailment that matters in this fight. For equipment, Seraph should keep the Synchro Ring, the Dragon Ring should go to Argilla, and then whatever third ring you prefer should go to your last unit. I kept the Pass Ring on Heat, but the Protect and Phantom Rings are still extremely useful. Seraph should have the Magatama ammo, and all other units should be using Gospel ammo, as Base 160 is the best alternative we have. Once you're ready, fly up, and let's get started. Phase 1 is his Fire Phase, and gives Brahmin Absorbed Fire. Full warning, Brahmin will consistently absorb the element of the phase that he's in, along with nulling, expel, death, and all ailments, so keep that in mind. Thankfully, this phase also has a few freebies for us. Xanadu and Hamon will do nothing but waste Brahmin's turns as they are expel type. Trasagion is the scariest attack he has, as it is undodgeable and deals very heavy fire damage to all targets, so fire walls will definitely be useful here. In terms of debuffs, this phase has Tarunda, Makanda, and Sukunda. While Makanda does nothing to us, Tarunda and Sekunda can be frustrating to deal with. However, this is where I discovered something extremely useful. You see, combo moves require two or more units to use. Since the units involved might have varying states of buffs and debuffs, rather than attempting to account for individual damage and accuracy changes of every unit involved in the combo, the game elects to ignore buffs and debuffs entirely. So even if Heat is at a minus 2 to attack with a minus 3 to accuracy, if he uses Twin Shot with another ally, whether he starts it or not, it will be treated as though he was at plus 0 to all stats. I cannot understate how huge of a discovery this was. Being able to circumvent Tarunda and Secunda is huge, as it gives us a lot more freedom with our turns. This allows Seraph, via the Synchro Ring, to consistently fire off Twin Shots while bypassing both their own debuffs, as well as Argilla's. Given we do still have to worry about missing with non-combo attacks, which includes our counters, so it's still worth it to use our debuff clearing strategies now and again. Phase 2 is the Force Phase. Outside of Via Via being severe undodgeable force damage, it sees Brahmin take a useful option for us, Gate of Hell. I debated bringing Null Death to prevent Stone, but Stone honestly isn't the end of the world. Stone prevents the unit from taking any kind of action and gives physical, gun, force, and earth attacks a chance to instantly kill. That said, even if we are stoned, which, mind you, Gate of Hell only has a 16% chance per target to apply stone, we can cure it with a Diz Stone if they're alive, or fully revive them with a Revival Orb if they die. The odds of every target getting stoned simultaneously is 0.4%, so it's realistically a non-issue. That being said, he also runs Dormina, which gives him a 41% chance to sleep any one target, which he can then follow up with Calm Death to instantly kill all sleeping targets. This is one reason we ran Null Nerve, as getting insta-gibbed like this would be a huge problem. Do keep in mind though, this phase does have Rakunda, and no amount of combos are going to make that hurt less. Phase 3 is his Earth phase, and sees some new tricks. Wicked Curse and Mudoon are annoying, but nothing Diz Curse and Revival Orbs can't deal with. However, this is when he breaks out a new move, Eternal Zero. This sets all of your units to minus 3 to all stats, and sets all of Brahmin's stats to plus 3. Throw out a Dekajarok to take care of Brahmin's maximized stats as quickly as possible. His defensive buffs will mitigate your damage, combos or not, and Titanomachia will be doing a lot more damage at plus 3. 
Also, just like Trasagion and Viavia before it, it's undodgeable. As for your minimized stats, either do rotations, let someone bite it, or make use of combos to keep your damage up. It is worth noting, all of Brahmin's phases use the same buff and debuff counter, so if you don't clear the buffs, he'll maintain them for all future phases. Speaking of, Phase 4 is his Electric Phase, and sees him maintain Eternal Zero, along with swapping Titana Machia for Narukami, which, you guessed it, is Electric-type and undodgeable. He also packs Neural Shock, which would be scary due to its inherent stun chance, but Null Nerve mitigates that. If he goes for Mind Charge, toss up a wall to block it. You do not want to get hit by a boosted attack like that. Phase 5 is his most dangerous of all. His Ice Phase has 6,000 HP, twice as much as all previous phases. He picks up Revert and Maravert, but that's the only mercy we're going to get today. He maintains Eternal Zero, swaps Narukami for Niflheim, blah blah undodgeable, but worst of all, his ultimate attack. Brahma Sutra. Brahma Sutra. Undodgeable, almighty, and has a unique mechanic. While Brahma Sutra won't do very much damage to start with, it'll progressively do more damage each time he uses it. Brahma Sutra effectively puts the fight on a soft timer. While there aren't guaranteed points in which Brahman will use Brahma Sutra, each time he decides to, it becomes harder and harder to mitigate. This section of the fight is absolutely nothing but a damage race. Combos, items, whatever is doing the most damage, you need to put it into him now, or Brahman is going to kill you. If you still have an Impel Stone from the Pyrojack, now's a good time to use it just for more turns to deal damage. But with enough damage, some luck, and one final crossfire for style points, we officially complete the Digital Devil Saga series without using any demons. I see, I see now, now the, the truth, truth of, of the world. world. I am God, and, and God, God is me. This is some sort of challenge, and I've won. The, the world can be saved, because I want to save it. Because people will save themselves. I have overcome the trials before me. I can save the world. I can't can go back. What? Do you think they'd let you finish without doing everything? There's three super bosses left. I, I thought, thought there, there were four super, super bosses. Eh, we'll get to it. Anyway, back down with you. Are, Are you, you serious? serious? <laughs> okay, yeah, we're not done. Throughout the sun, we can find two rare encounters. One against Parvati, and one against Narasimha. These two have a random chance to drop very specific key items, which unlock two optional super bosses that can tackle once you have access to Meganada. Narasima will drop the Nandaka, which unlocks Vishnu, and Parvati will drop the Pinaka, which unlocks... Uh... The Pinaka unlocks Shima. Both of them share a gimmick of altering their affinities throughout the battle based upon certain conditions. Since we are firmly within super boss territory, I elected to power grind my main party up to level 99 and unlock every single skill I feel like I could possibly want before putting any sincere attempts into these guys. Let's start with the quote-unquote easier of the two, Vishnu. Vishnu's gimmick is actually pretty simple. He'll start in a neutral phase, able to take damage from any source. Once he does though, he'll enter a phase corresponding to the damage you last hit him with. These phases are typically the inverse of the element you hit him with. For example, hitting him with Earth Element damage will put him into a state in which he voids Earth and absorbs Force before swinging into you with a Zandai. The exceptions to this are Physical, Gun, and Almighty. Physical and Gun attacks will put him into a unique Physical phase where he only has Physical attacks. And Almighty attacks will put him into a unique phase in which he spams his ultimate skill, Chaturbuja, in which somebody at Atlas thought a move which deals heavy, undodgeable, almighty physical damage 5 to 15 times to random targets with a 15% crit rate was remotely acceptable. Beyond this, he doesn't really have too much of concern. Besides their element specific options, all phases have Rage to grant two additional press turns, Makakaja to buff himself, 
and Vakunda to debuff you. Thankfully, this fight isn't too scary when you really break it down. Vishnu's affinities always include a void to physical, however, not gun. The only phase with gun mitigation is the physical phase, which absorbs it. As such, we can completely control this fight with two skills, Null Elements and Null Fizz. Turn 1, swing hard with gun combos. He'll swap to his physical phase to absorb gun and then throw out a random physical attack, which will just get nulled. Next turn, heal up and have somebody on your team use a Magni Bomb. He'll then swap to a force phase to null earth and swing in with force, which you'll lock because of null element. Now he can be hit by gun attacks, so lay into him with guns. Rinse repeat, rinse repeat. I do recommend fire, force, or earth for your attacks though, as electric and ice typically do slightly less damage. Once he's around 50% HP, he has a chance to start a turn by going into his almighty phase and casting Chaturbuja anyway. The good news is when he goes into the almighty phase this way, he does not spam it. He'll usually follow it up with Vanity or a buff or debuff spell. We can block Vanity with Null Ailment, but always be aware that he has the potential to go for this. If he's hit you with too many Rakundas, it's possible that Chaturbuja can drop you from full, especially if it crits. As such, you'll want to keep everybody as topped off on HP as you can, and if you are debuffed too much, don't be afraid to let somebody drop or do rotations to swap people out. I also like having Null Critical to reduce Chaturbuja's crit rate, since if he crits, it's almost guaranteed that a unit is dropping. I also liked Critical and Max Critical to ensure Seraph and Argilla are critting as much as possible. With enough luck and a bit of effort, Vishnu will fall. For defeating Vishnu, we are rewarded with three things. The first is a new ammo, Pandemonium. This ammo is power 300, eclipsing even the Magatama from the game before. Swap this onto Seraph immediately and pass the Magatama to Argilla. She'll do the most damage to it compared to every other gunner, and since we're only fighting single units from now on, Argilla will get the most use out of it. The second is the Aura Ring, a Karma Ring which provides plus 20 to all stats. If some of your units don't have max stats, this can be a way to shore that up, but more than likely, you're capped in everything you could ever want already. So this isn't that good. It is funny though that beating this fight completely eclipses the reward that you get for beating the Demi Fiend last game. Lastly, we unlock the God of Light mantra, which provides us the ability to learn Chaturbuja as well as Huang Long's Celestial Ray, which, as the Dragon Slayer mantra before it, is completely useless. Up next is Shiva, for whom we take the exact same strategy. Same skills, same rings, same ammo, bar the addition of Pandemonium. Unlike Vishnu, Shiva's affinities swap on a timer. On the first turn, Shiva will only be able to be damaged by fire and ice, to which he will take double damage under a false weakness. Then each turn, he'll move down the list by one element, to ice and electric. Then electric and force, then force and earth, then just earth. Following this, he enters an almighty phase where he has a false weakness to all elements before repeating the cycle. And while his kit throughout the turn stays the same, consisting mostly of physical attacks and various utility options like Last Word, Vanity, Debilitate, and Ragnarok, every time he hits the all elements phase, he will open with Third Eye, a severe almighty attack with a guaranteed stun chance. Null ailment or null nerve are a requirement here, preferably the former, you absolutely cannot do this fight with a chance of getting Bozo on stun. This fight is all about keeping track of what phase Shiva is on and knowing when he's about to swing for third eye so that you can know what moves are safe to swing into him with. However, and this could just be me being stupid, but it feels like sometimes he just falls off his affinity list. Like, I might be wrong, but I swear there are times in which what should be the right element just isn't. Regardless, just like Vishnu, Shiva will get pissed if you refuse to engage with his mechanic. If you hit him with an almighty attack, he'll respond by double casting third eye the next turn, which, since that does roughly 300 damage per shot, isn't exactly preferable. Or is it? So long as we are immune to nerve, third eye is basically just a very powerful Meki Dolan. And while we can't piss off Shiva with almighty, he also gets pissed if you use guns. Seriously, if you shoot Shiva in his face, he'll get really pissed and try to kill you now. Keep in mind, he is packing both Ragnarok and Debilitate, so he can spend as much time as he wants debuffing your stats. And since both of those affect defense, Third Eye will be doing an uncomfortable amount of damage. 
do not be afraid to let somebody drop in order to cleanse debuffs. It can be the easiest way to do so since we have a revival orb. Prioritize twin shot combos with Seraph using the Synchro Ring, comboing with Argilla for maximum damage. This should be doing around 300 damage normally, 600 on crit or false weakness, and almost 1200 damage under both. Considering we swing two times for free per turn, this will be a huge stream of damage so long as we can keep it up. To this end, I recommend bringing a hefty supply of group target healing items and using those to keep Seraph and Argilla going, as well as healing anyone who Shiva is able to do significant damage to. But so long as you can keep Shiva pissed off, we lobotomize his AI into giving us the win. Shiva's rewards are less useful, more useful, and insanely useful. Less useful is his reward on kill, which is... Soma? Like, I'm not complaining, but considering Vishnu dropped the absolute strongest ammo in the game for beating him, Asoma feels somewhat underwhelming. More useful is his mantra, the Aksara Mantra, which provides us with Fizz Absorb, the upgrade to Null Fizz, which allows us to completely invalidate someone's turn if they hit us with a physical hit. Insanely useful, however, is the ring he provides, the Turn Ring, which provides us with an additional press turn every round for free. With this, we finally have our final endgame Karma Ring set. The Synchro Ring for cheaper combos, the Pass Ring to pass over Heat's turn, and the Turn Ring for an additional action. And our final reward is the game's final non-New Game Plus Super Boss. After defeating both Vishnu and Shiva, a new path unlocks on the fifth layer of the sun. So we go back down, travel through the traditional room that kills you so many SMT games like to have, and make our way to the final super boss of the main game, Seth. Who is an absolute joke? Don't get me wrong, taken normally, Seth is a bastard. Spiteful Force does scaling damage based upon how much damage he's taken. Desert Wind can just yeet a unit out of the combat while also reducing them to exactly 150 HP. He's packing every single all-target elemental spell in the game, has several powerful physical attacks, Fatal Charm, Silent Howl, Vanity, Dekunda, Dekaja, Debilitate, Power Charge, and the funniest fucking standard attack in the entire game. Pain! Ah! So much pain! So much pain! Unlike normal enemies, who just use the standard attack move, Seth has a severe almighty physical attack with 99% accuracy and 40% critical rate that is literally just called... This makes Seth an extremely tough fight to deal with in a standard encounter. However, this isn't true for us due to one teensy weensy but ever so crucial little tiny detail. His affinities. Seth is immune to earth, expel, death, and ailments, resists physical, takes 20% less damage from fire, ice, electric force, and even almighty, and is weak to gun. This single detail shifts the fight almost entirely out of Seth's control. I actually recommend swapping Seraph and Argilla's rings and positions, setting up the team as Argilla heat Seraph, and giving Argilla the synchro ring and Seraph the turn ring. Since we will now be hitting weaknesses, we will be getting flashing press turns every round. And while Heat can skip over one of those with the pass ring, Seraph would dump them away. As such, have Argilla fire off a one turn twin shot, pass with Heat, and have Seraph fire off a basic pandemonium shot. Repeat, and you should have four blinking press turns. Assuming literally zero crits, which considering critical and max critical is fairly unlikely, you can repeat this twin shot pandemonium combo three times around for roughly 2,000 damage. Fire off one last twin shot, then have Heat toss off a medical tool to heal everyone for 300, which if you started this combo at full HP, will put everyone back to full. You might need to tweak the strategy a bit if you've taken additional damage from any of Seth's attacks, but for the most part, you can basically do this over and over without Seth really countering you in any way. Furthermore, the skills we've been running remove most of Seth's options. Null Element locks all of his all-target elementals. Null Element locks Vanity, Fatal Charm, and Silent Howl. Null Critical reduces Pain's crit rate to a more reasonable 20%, and Null Fizz blocks Revelation and Gain of Hell completely. I could have grinded Fizz Absorb off of the Aksara Mantra, which would have ended Seth's turns immediately if you went for any of those moves, but I... kinda... forgot? Regardless, 
this leaves Seth starved for options. The only options he has left are Maravert, which is useless, Blood Curse, which while we can be cursed, I honestly never saw him use, Debilitate, and his almighty options. Ragnarok, Megidolon, Pain, Spiteful Force, and Desert Wind. And yeah, sure, Ragnarok does hurt us, as does Debilitate, but when we have so much control over the fight, can ignore accuracy and offensive debuffs via combos, and can heal to full every single turn, Seth has to build up enough debuffs to drop somebody in one shot in order to do meaningful damage. However, since we can generate so many additional turns, we're able to more freely use the Revival Orb, meaning we can cleanse debuffs via death even more easily. There are really only two things of concern in this fight. Firstly, Desert Wind can toss a unit back into reserves and set their HP to 150. Despite how high I talked earlier, this is actually fairly inconvenient, since we need to spend a turn getting them back in and a turn healing them. But again, the level of turn economy we generate is so high that this isn't usually that much of a concern. Second is Spiteful Force, which, if you're debuffed enough via Ragnarok or Debilitate, can do some meaty damage to you. There were multiple points in which Seth could have killed me with any attack he liked, had he simply chosen to follow this up with even so much as a Megidolon. But whether by blind luck or pure skill, we managed to show the hardest super boss of the main game a power that conquers all things. The power of friendship and these guns we found. <laughs> Defeating Seth unlocks again three things. Firstly, the Root of Evil mantra which gives us Spiteful Force and Death Flies as learnable skills. Sadly, active skills, so these are a no-go. Secondly, a Great Chakra, which... okay. And finally, the Avoid Ring, a powerful ring which ends the enemy's turn immediately if the user ever dodges or nulls an attack, similar to the way repels and absorbs work. Furthermore, if you've been following along and collecting every single Karma Ring as I have, this is the final ring you need to unlock the strongest ring, the Master Ring, which gives you Null to all attacks except Almighty. And with Seth lying dead at our feet, we have officially completed Digital Devil Saga 2 without using... <sighs> Alright, let's talk about Satan. If you're playing on Hard Mode, which can either be done by transferring over a DDS1 save or by playing on New Game Plus, after beating Seth, a new path unlocks where he once stood, putting you before canonically Satan from Shin Megami Tensei 2. And Satan, similar to Demifiend, has a very specific way he wants to be fought. Unlike Demifiend, however, Satan does not offer any wiggle room. At the start of the fight, Satan casts Futility. This cancels any passives you might have from skills or rings that would provide you changes to your affinities. So if you have something like Null Elements, or are wearing that new Master Ring you just got, it's like they didn't exist. Once it's your turn, Satan, similar to Shiva, has rolling affinities. We'll refer to these states as turns, so it would be correct to say that on turn 1, Satan casts Utility. He only does this on his first turn 1, mind you. And after turn 1, he will repel Fizz and Gun, and take 80% damage from Fire, Ice, Electric Force, and Earth. In all phases, he repels Expel and Death, is immune to Elements, and resists Almighty, so keep that in mind. On turn 2, he trades Repel Fizz and Gun for Repel Fire, Ice, and Electric, so you can now damage him, albeit at 80% power, with Physical and Gun. Turn 3, he swaps Repel Fire for Repel Force, but the rest is the same. As for turn 4, for you, there is no turn 4. At the start of turn 4, Satan checks your field to see if there is at least one unit with a plus 3 to all stats. If this is true, he casts Dekaja, clearing all buffs your party has. If it's not, he casts God's Breath, which does a static 9999 undodgeable almighty damage, killing you instantly. And keep in mind, because all buffing options are active skills, this is impossible for us. For this fight to be possible, we would need to be capable of dealing the entirety of his 30,000 HP in damage over the course of the three turns we have prior to the buff check. There are other mechanics Satan will eventually bring into play too. Once he's taken 50% of his HP in damage, he'll start all future turn ones with Temptation, an undodgeable guaranteed charm. The only way to block this, conveniently, is to have somebody with Void Charm to block the hit, which there's not an item equivalent for. Oh, but what about Magic Mirrors, I hear you say? Wrong. If you use Makarakon or a Magic Mirror, Satan will target all three of your units individually with Retribution, 
an undodgeable almighty attack which instantly kills the target. This means that the only way to prevent our entire party from being charmed is by using a move we physically do not and cannot have. Speaking of retribution, once he's at 25% HP, he'll open all future turn 2s and 3s with the move as well. In this instance, he only uses the move once, targeting the unit with the lowest magic stat. In the event of a tie, he chooses randomly. At this point, and for the rest of the fight, you have to deal with a 100% chance of your entire party being charmed unless you use a move that you can't have on turn 1, your lowest magic unit dying on turns 2 and 3, and a buff check we cannot possibly make on turn 4, or else you die. And as if all of this somehow wasn't enough, once he's below 5% of his 30,000 HP, so 1500, you better make sure you take him from 1501 to 0 in a single round. Because if he gets a turn while below 1500, he will cast Diarahan, resetting the entire fight, every phase, all of it, back to square fucking one. I'm sorry if you're expecting me to say I found some off-the-wall technique that allows me to engine out 30,000 damage in three turns, but there isn't one. There is simply no means, by gun or glitch, to do that much damage that quickly in human form. But just because there isn't one now, doesn't mean that there won't be one forever. You might recall a video I posted a while back for Nocturne Hardtype, where I discovered a glitch to duplicate the effects of a Lusto Candy. While this didn't work for all items, it still proved the concept existed to pass one item's effects onto another. So I booted up DDS2 and tried everything I could think of from top to bottom to find a way to make the glitch work for Impel Stones. As I mentioned earlier, Impel Stones spend one action to give you four, being a net gain of three. But we can only have one at a time. So if we were to find a glitch to somehow obtain more or duplicate them, we would be able to take Satan down easily. And yet, I found nothing. So I decided to try and prove the concept possible using Game Shark codes. And yes, if you have 99 Impel Stones or can duplicate their effects, it's more than possible to defeat Satan before the check. I mean, obviously. We effectively have an additional 297 turns. So, if this is possible, this fight is doable. And if you ask me, someday, someone will find a way to make it doable. If there's one thing this game showed me, it's that humans can do anything if they try. They can tear the world apart, they can make peace, they can overcome insurmountable odds and challenges, self-imposed or no. Did I beat Digital Devil Saga 2 without using any demons? Yes. Did I complete Digital Devil Saga 2 without using any demons? No. Can you complete Digital Devil Saga 2 without using any demons? Go find out. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. If you like this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you want to see more voice acted content like this, be sure to subscribe to the Patreon or become a member on the YouTube channel itself. It lets us pay the voice actors more and helps us put more into these. Speaking of, special shout outs to YouTube members Fabrizio Pignataro, Not D. Wadler, Oplin2, and Daniel Trejo. And special shout outs to Patreon backers Axel Rosenberg, Ryan Vick, Hound, Dylan Toomey, Cuttlefish, and Grace and Me. I hope you enjoy the biggest project I've put out to date, and I'll see you in the next one.